This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. Chapter 19. It Has Come. Of course Dr. Craven had been sent for the morning after Colin had had his tantrum. He was always sent for at once when such a thing occurred, and he always found, when he arrived, a white, shaken boy lying on his bed, sulky, and still so hysterical that he was ready to break into fresh sobbing at the least word. In fact, Dr. Craven dreaded and detested the difficulties of these visits. On this occasion he was away from Misselthwaite Manor until afternoon. "'How is he?' he asked Mrs. Medlock, rather irritably, when he arrived. "'He will break a blood-vessel in one of those fits some day. The boy is half insane with hysteria and self-indulgence.' "'Well, sir,' answered Mrs. Medlock, "'you'll scarcely believe your eyes when you see him.' That plain, sour-faced child that's almost as bad as himself has just bewitched him. How she's done it there's no telling. The Lord knows she's nothing to look at, and you scarcely ever hear her speak. But she did what none of us dare do. She just flew at him like a little cat last night, and stamped her feet, and ordered him to stop screaming. And somehow she startled him so that he actually did stop, and this afternoon— "'Well, just come up and see, sir. It's past crediting.' The scene which Dr. Craven beheld when he entered his patient's room was indeed rather astonishing to him. As Mrs. Medlock opened the door he heard laughing and chattering. Colin was on his sofa in his dressing-gown, and he was sitting up quite straight looking at a picture in one of the garden-books, and talking to the plain child— who at that moment could scarcely be called plain at all, because her face was so glowing with enjoyment. "'Those long spires of blue ones! We'll have a lot of those,' Colin was announcing. "'They're called Delphiniums. "'Dickens says they're larkspurs made big and grand,' cried Mistress Mary. "'There are clumps there already.' Then they saw Dr. Craven, and stopped. Mary became quite still, and Colin looked fretful. "'I am sorry to hear you are ill last night, my boy,' Dr. Craven said a trifle nervously. He was rather a nervous man. "'I'm better now, much better,' Colin answered, rather like a rajah. "'I'm going out in my chair in a day or two if it is fine. I want some fresh air.' Dr. Craven sat down by him and felt his pulse— and looked at him curiously. "'It must be a very fine day,' he said, "'and you must be very careful not to tire yourself.' "'Fresh air won't tire me,' said the young Rajah. As there had been occasions when this same young gentleman had shrieked aloud with rage, and had insisted that fresh air would give him cold and kill him, it is not to be wondered at that his doctor felt somewhat startled. "'I thought you did not like fresh air,' he said. "'I don't when I am by myself,' replied the Rajah. "'But my cousin is going out with me.' "'And the nurse, of course,' suggested Dr. Craven. "'No, I will not have the nurse.' so magnificently that Mary could not help remembering how the young native prince had looked, with his diamonds and rubies and pearls stuck all over him, and the great rubies on the small dark hand he had waved to command his servants to approach with salams and receive his orders. "'My cousin knows how to take care of me. I am always better when she is with me. She made me better last night. A very strong boy, I know, will push my carriage.' Dr. Craven felt rather alarmed. If this tiresome, hysterical boy should chance to get well, he himself would lose all chance of inheriting Misselthwaite. But he was not an unscrupulous man, though he was a weak one, and he did not intend to let him run into actual danger. 
"'He must be a strong boy and a steady boy,' he said, "'and I must know something about him. "'Who is he? What is his name?' "'It's Dickon,' Mary spoke up suddenly. "'She felt somehow that everybody who knew the moor must know Dickon. "'And she was right, too. "'She saw that in a moment Dr. Craven's serious face relaxed into a relieved smile. "'Oh, Dickon,' he said. "'If it is Dickon, you will be safe enough. "'He's as strong as a moor pony, is Dickon.' "'And he's trusty,' said Mary. "'He's the trustiest lad of Yorkshire.' She had been talking Yorkshire to Colin, and she forgot herself. "'Did Dickon teach you that?' asked Dr. Craven, laughing outright. "'I'm learning it as if it was French,' said Mary, rather coldly. "'It's like a native dialect in India. Very clever people try to learn them. I like it, and so does Colin.' "'Well, well,' he said. "'If it amuses you, perhaps it won't do you any harm.' "'Did you take your bromide last night, Colin?' "'No,' Colin answered. "'I wouldn't take it at first, "'and after Mary made me quiet she talked me to sleep, "'in a low voice, about the spring creeping into a garden.' "'That sounds soothing,' said Dr. Craven, "'more perplexed than ever, "'and glancing sideways at Mistress Mary, "'sitting on her stool, "'and looking down silently at the carpet.' "'You are evidently better, but you must remember—' "'I don't want to remember,' interrupted the Rajah, appearing again. "'When I lie by myself and remember, I begin to have pains everywhere, "'and I think of things that make me begin to scream because I hate them so. "'If there was a doctor anywhere who could make you forget you were ill, "'instead of remembering it, I would have him brought here.' "'And he waved a thin hand— which ought really to have been covered with royal signet rings made of rubies. It is because my cousin makes me forget that she makes me better. Dr. Craven had never made such a short stay after a tantrum. Usually he was obliged to remain a very long time and do a great many things. This afternoon he did not give any medicine or leave any new orders, and he was spared any disagreeable scenes. When he went downstairs he looked very thoughtful, and when he talked to Mrs. Medlock in the library she felt that he was a much puzzled man. "'Well, sir,' she ventured, "'could you have believed it?' "'It is certainly a new state of affairs,' said the doctor, "'and there's no denying it is better than the old one.' "'I believe Susan Sowerby's right. I do that.' said Mrs. Medlock. I stopped in her cottage on my way to Thwaite yesterday, and had a bit of a talk with her, and she says to me, "'Well, Sarah Ann, she mayn't be a good child, and she mayn't be a pretty one, but she's a child, and children needs children. We went to school together, Susan Sowerby and me.' "'She's the best sick nurse I know,' said Dr. Craven. "'When I find her in a cottage,' I know the chances are that I shall save my patient. Mrs. Medlock smiled. She was fond of Susan Sowerby. She's got away with her, has Susan. She went on quite volubly. I've been thinking all morning of one thing she said yesterday. She says, Once, when I was given the children a bit of a preach, after they'd been fightin', I says to em all, when I was at school my geography told us the world was shaped like an orange, and I found out before I was ten that the whole orange doesn't belong to nobody. No one owns more than his bit of a quarter, and there's times it seems like there's not enough quarters to go round. But don't you, none of you, think as you own the whole orange, or you'll find out you're mistaken, and you won't find it out without hard knocks. What children learns from children, she says, is that there's no sense in grabbin' at the whole orange, peel and all. If you do, you'll likely not get even the pips, and them's too bitter to eat. "'She's a shrewd woman,' said Dr. Craven, putting on his coat. "'Well, she's got a way of saying things,' ended Mrs. Medlock, much pleased. "'Sometimes I've said to her, 
"'Eh, Susan, if you was a different woman and didn't talk such broad Yorkshire, "'I've seen the times when I should have said you was clever.' That night Colin slept without once awakening, and when he opened his eyes in the morning he lay still and smiled without knowing it, smiled, because he felt so curiously comfortable. It was actually nice to be awake, and he turned over and stretched his limbs luxuriously. He felt as if tight strings which had held him had loosened themselves and let him go. He did not know that Dr. Craven would have said that his nerves had relaxed and rested themselves. Instead of lying and staring at the wall and wishing he had not awakened, his mind was full of the plans he and Mary had made yesterday, of pictures of the garden and of Dickon and his wild creatures. It was so nice to have things to think about. And he had not been awake more than ten minutes when he heard feet running along the corridor and Mary was at the door. The next minute she was in the room, and had run across to his bed, bringing with her a waft of fresh air full of the scent of the morning. "'You've been out! You've been out! There's that nice smell of leaves!' he cried. She had been running, and her hair was loose and blown, and she was bright with the air, and pink-cheeked, though he could not see it. "'It's so beautiful,' she said, a little breathless with her speed. "'You never saw anything so beautiful. It has come. I thought it had come that other morning, but it was only coming. It is here now. It has come, the spring. Dickon says so.' "'Has it?' cried Colin, and though he really knew nothing about it, he felt his heart beat. He actually sat up in bed.' "'Open the window,' he added, laughing half with joyful excitement and half at his own fancy. "'Perhaps we may hear golden trumpets.' And though he laughed, Mary was at the window in a moment, and in a moment more it was opened wide, and freshness and softness and scents and birds' songs were pouring through. "'That's fresh air,' she said. "'Lie on your back and draw in long breaths of it. "'That's what Dickon does when he's lying on the moor. "'He says he feels it in his veins, and it makes him strong, "'and he feels as if he could live for ever and ever. "'Breathe it and breathe it.' "'She was only repeating what Dickon had told her, "'but she caught Colin's fancy. "'For ever and ever, does it make him feel like that?' "'He said.' and he did as she told him, drawing in long, deep breaths over and over again, until he felt that something quite new and delightful was happening to him. Mary was at his bedside again. "'Things are crowding up out of the earth,' she ran on in a hurry, "'and there are flowers uncurling, and buds on everything, and the green veil has covered nearly all the grey, and the birds are in such a hurry about their nests, for fear they may be too late, that some of them are even fighting for places in the secret garden. And the rose-bushes look as wick as wick can be, and there are primroses in the lanes and woods, and the seeds we planted are up, and Dickon has brought the fox and the crow and the squirrels, and a new-born lamb. And then she paused for breath. The new-born lamb Dickon had found three days before, lying by its dead mother, among the gorse-bushes on the moor. It was not the first motherless lamb he had found, and he knew what to do with it. He had taken it to the cottage, wrapped in his jacket, and he had let it lie near the fire, and had fed it with warm milk. It was a soft thing, with a darling silly baby face, and legs rather long for its body. Dickon had carried it over the moor in his arms, and its feeding-bottle was in his pocket with a squirrel, and when Mary had sat under a tree with its limp warmness huddled on her lap, she had felt as if she were too full of strange joy to speak. A lamb, a lamb, a living lamb who lay on your lap like a baby. She was describing it with great joy, and Colin was listening and drawing in long breaths of air when the nurse entered. 
she started a little at the sight of the open window. She had sat stifling in the room many a warm day because her patient was sure that open windows gave people cold. "'Are you sure you are not chilly, Master Colin?' she inquired. "'No,' was the answer. "'I am breathing long breaths of fresh air. It makes you strong. I am going to get up to the sofa for breakfast. My cousin will have breakfast with me.' The nurse went away, concealing a smile, to give the order for two breakfasts. She found the servants' hall a more amusing place than the invalid's chamber, and just now everybody wanted to hear the news from upstairs. There was a great deal of joking about the unpopular young recluse who, as the cook said, had found his master and good for him. The servants' hall had been very tired of the tantrums, and the butler, who was a man with a family, had more than once expressed his opinion that the invalid would be all the better for a good hiding. When Colin was on his sofa, and the breakfast for two was put upon the table, he made an announcement to the nurse in his most Rajah-like manner. A boy, and a fox, and a crow, and two squirrels, and a new-born lamb are coming to see me this morning. I want them brought upstairs as soon as they come," he said. "'You are not to begin playing with the animals in the servants' hall and keep them there. I want them here.' The nurse gave a slight gasp, and tried to conceal it with a cough. "'Yes, sir,' she answered. "'I'll tell you what you can do,' added Colin, waving his hand. "'You can tell Martha to bring them here. The boy is Martha's brother. His name is Dickon and he is an animal charmer. "'I hope the animals won't bite, Master Colin,' said the nurse. "'I told you he was a charmer,' said Colin, austerely. "'Charmer's animals never bite.' "'There are snake-charmers in India,' said Mary, "'and they can put their snakes' heads in their mouths.' "'Goodness!' shuddered the nurse. They ate their breakfast with the morning air pouring in upon them. Colin's breakfast was a very good one, and Mary watched him with serious interest. "'You will begin to get fatter just as I did,' she said. "'I never wanted my breakfast when I was in India, and now I always want it.' "'I wanted mine this morning,' said Colin. "'Perhaps it was the fresh air. When do you think Dickon will come?' He was not long in coming. In about ten minutes Mary held up her hand. "'Listen,' she said, "'did you hear a caw?' Colin listened and heard it, the oddest sound in the world to hear inside a house, a hoarse, "'Caw! Caw!' "'Yes,' he answered. "'That's soot,' said Mary. "'Listen again. Do you hear a bleat, a tiny one?' "'Oh, yes!' cried Colin quite flushing. "'That's the newborn lamb,' said Mary. "'He's coming.' Dickens' moorland boots were thick and clumsy, and though he tried to walk quietly they made a clumping sound as he walked through the long corridors. Mary and Colin heard him marching, marching, until he passed through the tapestry door on to the soft carpet of Colin's own passage. "'If you please, sir,' announced Martha, opening the door. "'If you please, sir, here's Dickon and his creatures.' Dickon came in, smiling his nicest wide smile. The new-born lamb was in his arms, and the little red fox trotted by his side. Nut sat on his left shoulder, and Soot on his right, and Shell's head and paws peeped out of his coat-pocket. Colin slowly sat up and stared and stared, as he had stared when he first saw Mary, but this was a stare of wonder and delight. The truth was that in spite of all he had heard, he had not in the least understood what this boy would be like, and that his fox and his crow and his squirrels and his lamb were so near to him and his friendliness that they seemed almost to be a part of himself. Colin had never talked to a boy in his life, and he was so overwhelmed by his own pleasure and curiosity 
that he did not even think of speaking. But Dickon did not feel the least shy or awkward. He had not felt embarrassed because the crow had not known his language, and had only stared and had not spoken to him the first time they met. Creatures were always like that until they found out about you. He walked over to Colin's sofa and put the newborn lamb quietly on his lap, and immediately the little creature turned to the warm velvet dressing gown and began to nuzzle and nuzzle into its folds and butt its tight curled head with soft impatience against his side. Of course, no boy could have helped speaking then. What is it doing? cried Colin. What does it want? It wants its mother. Said Dickon, smiling more and more. I brought it to thee a bit hungry because I knowed thou'd like to see it feed. He knelt down by the sofa and took a feeding bottle from his pocket. Come on, little un, he said, turning the small woolly white head with a gentle brown hand. This is what thou's after. Thou'll get more out o' this than thou will out o' silk velvet coats. There now. And he pushed the rubber tip of the bottle into the nuzzling mouth, and the lamb began to suck it with ravenous ecstasy. After that, there was no wondering what to say. By the time the lamb fell asleep, questions poured forth, and Dickon answered them all. He told them how he had found the lamb just as the sun was rising three mornings ago. He had been standing on the moor listening to a skylark. And watching him swing higher and higher into the sky until he was only a speck in the heights of blue. I'd almost lost him but for his song, and I was wondering how a chap could hear it when it seemed as if he'd get out of the world in a minute. And just then I heard something else far off among the gorse bushes. It was a weak bleatin', and I knowed it was the new lamb as was hungry, and I knowed it wouldn't be hungry if it hadn't lost its mother somehow. So I set off searchin'. Eh, I did have a look for it. I went in and out among the gorse bushes and round and round, and I always seemed to take the wrong turnin'. But at last I seed a bit o' white by a rock on top o' the moor, and I climbed up and found the little un half dead wi' cold and clemmin'. While he talked, Soot flew solemnly in and out of the open window and cawed remarks about the scenery. While Nut and Shell made excursions into the big trees outside and ran up and down trunks and explored branches. Captain curled up near Dickon, who sat on the hearth rug from preference. They looked at the pictures in the gardening books, and Dickon knew all the flowers by their country names, and knew exactly which ones were already growing in the secret garden. I couldna say that their name, he said. Pointing to one under which was written Aquilegia. But us calls that a columbine, and that there one it's a snapdragon, and they both grow wild in hedges, but these is garden ones, and they are bigger and grander. There's some big clumps o columbine in the garden. They'll look like a bed o' blue and white butterflies flutterin' when they're out. I'm going to see them, cried Colin. I am going to see them. Ay, that the mun, said Mary, quite seriously. And the munnot lose no time about it. End of chapter nineteen. Read by Kara Schallenberg on February eleventh, two thousand six, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. Chapter 20 I Shall Live For Ever and Ever and Ever. But they were obliged to wait more than a week because first there came some very windy days, and then Colin was threatened with a cold, which two things happening one after the other would no doubt have thrown him into a rage, but that there was so much careful and mysterious planning to do, 
and almost every day Dickon came in, if only for a few minutes, to talk about what was happening on the moor, and in the lanes and hedges, and on the borders of streams. The things he had to tell about otters and badgers and water-rats' houses, not to mention birds' nests and field-mice and their burrows, were enough to make you almost tremble with excitement when you heard all the intimate details from an animal charmer, and realized with what thrilling eagerness and anxiety the whole busy underworld was working. "'They're the same as us,' said Dickon. "'Only they have to build their homes every year, and it keeps them so busy they fare scuffle to get em done.' The most absorbing thing, however, was the preparations to be made before Colin could be transported with sufficient secrecy to the garden. No one must see the chair-carriage, and Dickon and Mary, after they turned a certain corner of the shrubbery, and entered upon the walk outside the ivied walls. As each day passed, Colin had become more and more fixed in his feeling that the mystery surrounding the garden was one of its greatest charms. Nothing must spoil that. No one must ever suspect that they had a secret. People must think that he was simply going out with Mary and Dickon because he liked them, and did not object to their looking at him. They had long and quite delightful talks about their route. They would go up this path, and down that one, and cross the other, and go round among the fountain flower-beds as if they were looking at the bedding-out plants the head gardener, Mr. Roach, had been having arranged. That would seem such a rational thing to do that no one would think it at all mysterious. They would turn into the shrubbery walks, and lose themselves until they came to the long walls. It was almost as serious and elaborately thought out as the plans of march made by great generals in time of war. Rumours of the new and curious things which were occurring in the invalid's apartments had of course filtered through the servants' hall, into the stable-yards, and out among the gardeners. But, notwithstanding this, Mr. Roach was startled one day, when he received orders from Master Collins' room, to the effect that he must report himself in the apartment no outsider had ever seen, as the invalid himself desired to speak to him. "'Well, well,' he said to himself, as he hurriedly changed his coat. "'What's to do now? His Royal Highness that wasn't to be looked at, calling up a man he's never set eyes on.' Mr. Roach was not without curiosity. He had never caught even a glimpse of the boy, and had heard a dozen exaggerated stories about his uncanny looks and ways, and his insane tempers. The thing he had heard oftenest was that he might die at any moment, and there had been numerous fanciful descriptions of a humped back and helpless limbs, given by people who had never seen him. "'Things are changing in this house, Mr. Roach,' said Mrs. Medlock, as she led him up the back staircase to the corridor on to which opened the hitherto mysterious chamber. "'Let us hope they're changing for the better, Mrs. Medlock,' he answered. "'They couldn't well change for the worse,' she continued, "'and, queer as it all is, there's them as finds their duties made a lot easier to stand up under.' "'Don't you be surprised, Mr. Roach, if you find yourself in the middle of a menagerie, "'and Martha Sowerby's Dickon more at home than you or me could ever be.' "'There really was a sort of magic about Dickon, as Mary always privately believed. "'When Mr. Roach heard his name, he smiled quite leniently. "'He'd be at home in Buckingham Palace, or at the bottom of a coal-mine,' he said. "'And yet it's not impudence, either.' He's just fine, is that lad. It was perhaps well he had been prepared, or he might have been startled. When the bedroom door was opened, a large crow, which seemed quite at home, perched on the high back of a carven chair, announced the entrance of a visitor by saying, Caw, caw, quite loudly. In spite of Mrs. Medlock's warning, Mr. Roach only just escaped being sufficiently undignified to jump backward. 
the young Raja was neither in bed nor on his sofa. He was sitting in an armchair, and a young lamb was standing by him, shaking its tail in feeding lamb fashion, as Dickon knelt giving it milk from its bottle. A squirrel was perched on Dickon's bent back, attentively nibbling a nut. The little girl from India was sitting on a big footstool, looking on. "'Here is Mr. Roach, Master Colin,' said Mrs. Medlock. The young Rajah turned, and looked his servitor over. At least, that was what the head gardener felt happened. "'Oh, you are Roach, are you?' he said. "'I sent for you to give you some very important orders.' "'Very good, sir,' answered Roach, wondering if he was to receive instructions to fell all the oaks in the park, or to transform the orchards into water-gardens. "'I am going out in my chair this afternoon,' said Colin. "'If the fresh air agrees with me, I may go out every day. When I go, none of the gardeners are to be anywhere near the long walk by the garden walls. No one is to be there. I shall go out about two o'clock, and every one must keep away until I send word that they may go back to their work. "'Very good, sir,' replied Mr. Roach, much relieved to hear that the oaks might remain, and that the orchards were safe. "'Mary,' said Colin, turning to her, "'what is that thing you say in India, when you have finished talking and want people to go?' "'You say, you have my permission to go.' answered Mary. The Raja waved his hand. "'You have my permission to go, Roach,' he said. "'But remember, this is very important.' "'Caw, caw,' remarked the crow hoarsely, but not impolitely. "'Very good, sir. Thank you, sir,' said Mr. Roach, and Mrs. Medlock took him out of the room. Outside in the corridor, being a rather good-natured man, he smiled until he almost laughed. "'My word!' he said. "'He's got a fine lordly way with him, hasn't he? You'd think he was a whole royal family rolled into one, prince consort and all.' "'Eh!' protested Mrs. Medlock. "'We've had to let him trample all over every one of us ever since he had feet, and he thinks that's what folks was born for.' "'Perhaps he'll grow out of it if he lives,' suggested Mr. Roach. "'Well, there's one thing pretty sure,' said Mrs. Medlock. "'If he does live, and that Indian child stays here, "'I'll warrant she teaches him that the whole orange does not belong to him, "'as Susan Sowerby says. "'And he'll be likely to find out the size of his own quarter.' Inside the room Colin was leaning back on his cushions. "'It's all safe now,' he said. "'And this afternoon I shall see it. "'This afternoon I shall be in it.' "'Dickon went back to the garden with his creatures, "'and Mary stayed with Colin. "'She did not think he looked tired, "'but he was very quiet before their lunch came, "'and he was quiet while they were eating it. "'She wondered why, and asked him about it. "'What big eyes you've got, Colin,' she said. "'When you are thinking they get as big as saucers. "'What are you thinking about now?' "'I can't help thinking about what it will look like,' he answered. "'The garden?' asked Mary. "'The springtime,' he said. "'I was thinking that I've really never seen it before. "'I scarcely ever went out, and when I did go I never looked at it. "'I didn't even think about it.' "'I never saw it in India because there wasn't any,' said Mary. Shut in and morbid as his life had been, Colin had more imagination than she had, and at least he had spent a good deal of time looking at wonderful books and pictures. "'That morning when you ran in and said, "'It's come, it's come, you made me feel quite queer. "'It sounded as if things were coming with a great procession.' and big bursts and wafts of music. I have a picture like it in one of my books, crowds of lovely people and children with garlands, 
and branches with blossoms on them, everyone laughing and dancing and crowding and playing on pipes. That was why I said, perhaps we shall hear golden trumpets, and told you to throw open the window. How funny, said Mary, that's really just what it feels like. And if all the flowers and leaves and green things and birds and wild creatures danced past at once, what a crowd it would be! I'm sure they'd dance and sing and flute, and that would be the wafts of music. They both laughed, but it was not because the idea was laughable, but because they both so liked it. A little later the nurse made Colin ready. She noticed that instead of lying like a log while his clothes were put on, he sat up, and made some efforts to help himself, and he talked and laughed with Mary all the time. "'This is one of his good days, sir,' she said to Dr. Craven, who dropped in to inspect him. "'He's in such good spirits that it makes him stronger. "'I'll call in again later in the afternoon, after he has come in,' said Dr. Craven. I must see how the going out agrees with him. I wish, in a very low voice, that he would let you go with him. I'd rather give up the case this moment, sir, than even stay here while it's suggested, answered the nurse with sudden firmness. I hadn't really decided to suggest it, said the doctor, with his slight nervousness. We'll try the experiment. Dickens, a lad, I'd trust with a newborn child. The strongest footman in the house carried Colin downstairs and put him in his wheeled chair, near which Dickon waited outside. After the manservant had arranged his rugs and cushions, the Rajah waved his hand to him and to the nurse. You have my permission to go, he said, and they both disappeared quickly, and it must be confessed. Giggled when they were safely inside the house. Dickon began to push the wheeled chair slowly and steadily. Mistress Mary walked beside it, and Colin leaned back and lifted his face to the sky. The arch of it looked very high, and the small snowy clouds seemed like white birds floating on outspread wings below its crystal blueness. The wind swept in soft big breaths down from the moor, and was strange with a wild, clear scented sweetness. Colin kept lifting his thin chest to draw it in, and his big eyes looked as if it were they which were listening, listening, instead of his ears. There are so many sounds of singing and humming and calling out, he said. What is that scent the puffs of wind bring? "'It's gorse on the moor that's open and out,' answered Dickon. "'Eh, the bees are at it wonderful to-day.' Not a human creature was to be caught sight of in the paths they took. In fact, every gardener or gardener's lad had been witched away. But they wound in and out among the shrubbery, and out and round the fountain-beds, following their carefully planned route for the mere mysterious pleasure of it. But when at last they turned into the long walk by the ivied walls, the excited sense of an approaching thrill made them, for some curious reason they could not have explained, begin to speak in whispers. "'This is it,' breathed Mary. "'This is where I used to walk up and down and wonder and wonder.' "'Is it?' cried Colin, and his eyes began to search the ivy with eager curiousness. "'But I can see nothing,' he whispered. "'There is no door.' "'That's what I thought,' said Mary. Then there was a lovely, breathless silence, and the chair wheeled on. "'That is the garden where Ben Weatherstaff works,' said Mary. "'Is it?' said Colin. A few yards more, and Mary whispered again, "'This is where the robin flew over the wall,' she said. "'Is it?' cried Colin. "'Oh, I wish he'd come again.' "'And that,' said Mary, with solemn delight, "'pointing under a big lilac bush, 
is where he perched on the little heap of earth and showed me the key. Then Colin sat up. Where, where, there, he cried, and his eyes were as big as the wolf's in Red Riding Hood, when Red Riding Hood felt called upon to remark on them. Dickon stood still, and the wheeled chair stopped. And this, said Mary, stepping on to the bed close to the ivy, is where I went to talk to him when he chirped at me from the top of the wall. And this is the ivy the wind blew back. And she took hold of the hanging green curtain. Oh, is it, is it? gasped Colin. And here is the handle, and here is the door. Dickon, push him in, push him in quickly. And Dickon did it with one strong, steady, splendid push. But Colin had actually dropped back against his cushions, even though he gasped with delight, and he had covered his eyes with his hands and held them there, shutting out everything until they were inside, and the chair stopped as if by magic, and the door was closed. Not till then did he take them away and look round and round and round, as Dickon and Mary had done. And over walls and earth and trees and swinging sprays and tendrils the fair green veil of tender little leaves had crept, and in the grass under the trees and the grey urns in the alcoves, and here and there everywhere, were touches or splashes of gold and purple and white, and the trees were showing pink and snow above his head, and there were flutterings of wings and faint sweet pipes and humming and scents and scents. And the sun fell warm upon his face like a hand with a lovely touch. And in wonder Mary and Dickon stood and stared at him. He looked so strange and different, because a pink glow of color had actually crept all over him. Ivory face and neck and hands and all. I shall get well, I shall get well, he cried out. Mary, Dickon, I shall get well, and I shall live for ever and ever and ever. End of chapter 20 Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 11, 2006, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. Chapter 21 Ben Weatherstaff. One of the strange things about living in the world is that it is only now and then one is quite sure one is going to live for ever and ever and ever. One knows it sometimes when one gets up at the tender, solemn dawn-time, and goes out and stands alone, and throws one's head far back, and looks up and up, and watches the pale sky slowly changing and flushing, and marvellous unknown things happening, until the east almost makes one cry out, and one's heart stands still at the strange, unchanging majesty of the rising of the sun, which has been happening every morning for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. One knows it then, for a moment or so, and one knows it some time when one stands by oneself in a wood at sunset, and the mysterious deep gold stillness slanting through and under the branches seems to be saying slowly again and again, something one cannot quite hear, however much one tries. Then sometimes the immense quiet of the dark blue at night, with millions of stars waiting and watching, makes one sure, and sometimes a sound of far-off music makes it true, and sometimes a look in someone's eyes. 
and it was like that with Colin when he first saw and heard and felt the springtime inside the four high walls of a hidden garden. That afternoon the whole world seemed to devote itself to being perfect and radiantly beautiful and kind to one boy. Perhaps out of pure heavenly goodness the spring came and crowned everything it possibly could into that one place. More than once Dickon paused in what he was doing and stood still, with a sort of growing wonder in his eyes, shaking his head softly. "'Eh, it is gradely,' he said. "'I'm twelve going on thirteen, and there's a lot of afternoons in thirteen years, but seems to me like I never seed one as gradely as this year. "'Ay, it is a gradely one,' said Mary, and she sighed for mere joy. "'I'll warrant it's the gradeliest one as ever was in this world.' "'Does the think,' said Colin, with dreamy carefulness, "'as happen it was made, like this ere, all a purpose for me?' "'My word!' cried Mary, admiringly. "'That there is a bit o' good Yorkshire. "'Thou'rt shapen first-rate, that thou'rt.' "'And delight reigned.' They drew the chair under the plum-tree, which was snow-white with blossoms and musical with bees. It was like a king's canopy, a fairy king's. There were flowering cherry-trees near, and apple-trees whose buds were pink and white, and here and there one had burst wide open. Between the blossoming branches of the canopy bits of blue sky looked down like wonderful eyes. Mary and Dickon worked a little here and there, and Colin watched them. They brought him things to look at, buds which were opening, buds which were tight-closed, bits of twig whose leaves were just showing green, the feather of a woodpecker which had dropped on the grass, the empty shell of some bird early hatched. Dickon pushed the chair slowly round and round the garden, stopping every other moment to let him look at wonders springing out of the earth or trailing down from trees. It was like being taken in state round the country of a magic king and queen, and shown all the mysterious riches it contained. "'I wonder if we shall see the robin,' said Colin. "'They'll see him often and now after a bit,' answered Dickon. "'When the eggs hatches out,' The little chap he'll be kept so busy it'll make his head swim. They'll see him flyin' backward and forward, carrying worms nigh as big as himself, and that much noise goin' on in the nest when he gets there, as fair flusters him so as he scarce knows which big mouth to drop the first piece in. And gapin' beaks and squawks on every side. Mother says as when she sees the work a robin has to do to keep them gapin' beaks filled, she feels like she was a lady with nothin' to do. She says she's seen the little chaps when it seemed like the sweat must be droppin' off em, though folk can't see it. This made them giggle so delightedly that they were obliged to cover their mouths with their hands, remembering that they must not be heard. Colin had been instructed as to the law of whispers and low voices several days before. He liked the mysteriousness of it, and did his best, but in the midst of excited enjoyment it is rather difficult never to laugh above a whisper. Every moment of the afternoon was full of new things, and every hour the sunshine grew more golden. The wheeled chair had been drawn back under the canopy, and Dickon had sat down on the grass, and had just drawn out his pipe, when Colin saw something he had not had time to notice before. "'That's a very old tree over there, isn't it?' he said. Dickon looked across the grass at the tree, and Mary looked, and there was a brief moment of stillness. "'Yes,' answered Dickon, after it, and his low voice had a very gentle sound. Mary gazed at the tree, and thought. "'The branches are quite grey, and there's not a single leaf anywhere,' Colin went on. "'It's quite dead, isn't it?' "'Aye,' admitted Dickon. "'But them roses as has climbed all over it "'will near hide every bit of the dead wood "'when they're full o' leaves and flowers. "'It won't look dead then. "'It'll be the prettiest of all.' "'Mary still gazed at the tree and thought. 
"'It looks as if a big branch had been broken off,' said Colin. "'I wonder how it was done.' "'It's been done many a year,' answered Dickon. "'Eh!' with a sudden relieved start, and laying his hand on Colin. "'Look at that robin! There he is! He's been foraging for his mate!' Colin was almost too late, but he just caught sight of him, the flash of red-breasted bird with something in his beak. He darted through the greenness and into the close-grown corner, and was out of sight. Colin leaned back on his cushion again, laughing a little. "'He's taking her tea to her. Perhaps it's five o'clock. I think I'd like some tea myself.' And so they were safe. "'It was magic which sent the robin,' said Mary secretly to Dickon afterward. I know it was magic. For both she and Dickon had been afraid Colin might ask something about the tree whose branch had broken off ten years ago, and they had talked it over together, and Dickon had stood and rubbed his head in a troubled way. "'We mun look as if it wasn't no different from the other trees,' he had said. "'We couldn't never tell him how it broke, poor lad. If he says anything about it, we mun, we mun try to look cheerful.' "'Ay, that we mun,' had answered Mary. But she had not felt as if she looked cheerful when she gazed at the tree. She wondered and wondered in those few moments if there was any reality in that other thing Dickon had said. He had gone on rubbing his rust-red hair in a puzzled way. But a nice comforted look had begun to grow in his blue eyes. "'Mrs. Craven was a very lovely young lady,' he had gone on rather hesitatingly. "'And, mother, she thinks maybe she's about Misselthwaite many a time looking after Mr. Colin, same as all mothers do when they are took out of the world. They have to come back, the seas. Happen she's been in the garden, and happen it was her set us to work, and told us to bring him here.' Mary had thought he meant something about magic. She was a great believer in magic. Secretly she quite believed that Dickon worked magic, of course good magic, on everything near him, and that was why people liked him so much, and wild creatures knew he was their friend. She wondered indeed if it were not possible that his gift had brought the robin just at the right moment, when Colin asked that dangerous question. She felt that his magic was working all the afternoon, and making Colin look like an entirely different boy. It did not seem possible that he could be the crazy creature who had screamed and beaten and bitten his pillow. Even his ivory whiteness seemed to change. The faint glow of colour which had shone on his face and neck and hands when he first got inside the garden never really quite died away. He looked as if he were made of flesh instead of ivory or wax. They saw the robin carry food to his mate two or three times, and it was so suggestive of afternoon tea that Colin felt they must have some. "'Go and make one of the men-servants bring some in a basket to the rhododendron walk,' he said, "'and then you and Dickon can bring it here.' It was an agreeable idea, easily carried out, and when the white cloth was spread upon the grass, with hot tea and buttered toast and crumpets, a delightfully hungry meal was eaten, and several birds on domestic errands paused to inquire what was going on, and were led into investigating crumbs with great activity. Nut and Shell whisked up trees with pieces of cake, and Soot took the entire half of a buttered crumpet into a corner, and pecked at, and examined, and turned it over, and made hoarse remarks about it until he decided to swallow it all joyfully in one gulp. The afternoon was dragging towards its mellow hour. The sun was deepening the gold of its lances, the bees were going home, and the birds were flying past less often. Dickon and Mary were sitting on the grass. The tea-basket was repacked, ready to be taken back to the house, and Colin was lying against his cushions with his heavy locks pushed back from his forehead, and his face looking quite a natural colour. "'I don't want this afternoon to go,' he said, "'but I shall come back to-morrow, 
and the day after, and the day after, and the day after. "'You'll get plenty of fresh air, won't you?' said Mary. "'I'm going to get nothing else,' he answered. "'I've seen the spring now, and I'm going to see the summer. I'm going to see everything grow here. I'm going to grow here myself.' "'That the will,' said Dickon. "'Us'll have thee walkin' about here and diggin' same as other folk afore long.' Colin flushed tremendously. "'Walk,' he said, "'dig, shall I?' Dickens' glance at him was delicately cautious. Neither he nor Mary had ever asked if anything was the matter with his legs. "'For sure the will,' he said stoutly. "'The, thus got legs o' thine own, same as other folks.' Mary was rather frightened until she heard Colin's answer. "'Nothing really ails them,' he said. "'But they are so thin and weak, they shake, so that I am afraid to try to stand on them.' Both Mary and Dickon drew a relieved breath. "'When the stops bein' afraid, thou'lt stand on em,' Dickon said, with renewed cheer. "'And thou'lt stop bein' afraid in a bit.' "'I shall,' said Colin. And he lay still as if he were wondering about things. They were really very quiet for a little while. The sun was dropping lower. It was that hour when everything stills itself— and they really had had a busy and exciting afternoon. Colin looked as if he were resting luxuriously. Even the creatures had ceased moving about, and had drawn together, and were resting near them. Soot had perched on a low branch, and drawn up one leg, and dropped the grey film drowsily over his eyes. Mary privately thought he looked as if he might snore in a minute. In the midst of this stillness it was rather startling when Colin half lifted his head, and exclaimed in a loud, suddenly alarmed whisper, "'Who is that man?' Dickon and Mary scrambled to their feet. "'Man?' they both cried in low, quick voices. Colin pointed to the high wall. "'Look!' he whispered excitedly. "'Just look!' Mary and Dickon wheeled about and looked. There was Ben Weatherstaff's indignant face glaring at them over the wall from the top of a ladder. He actually shook his fist at Mary. "'If I wasn't a bachelor and thou was a wench o' mine,' he cried, "'I'd give thee a hidin'.' He mounted another step threateningly, as if it were his energetic intention to jump down and deal with her. But as she came toward him he evidently thought better of it, and stood on the top step of his ladder— "'shaking his fist down at her. "'I never thought much o' thee,' he harangued. "'I could na abide thee the first time I set eyes on thee. "'A scrawny, buttermilk-faced young besom, "'all is askin' questions and pokin' the nose where it was na wanted. "'I never knowed how thou got so thick wi' me. "'If it hadna been for the robin, drat him!' "'Ben Weatherstaff,' called out Mary, finding her breath. She stood below him, and called up to him with a sort of gasp. "'Ben Weatherstaff! It was the robin who showed me the way!' Then it did seem as if Ben really would scramble down on her side of the wall. He was so outraged. "'The young badden!' he called down at her. "'Layin' the badness on a robin! Not but what he's impotent now for anything. Him showin' thee the way! Him! Eh, the young nout!' She could see his next words burst out because he was overpowered by curiosity. "'However in this world did thou get in?' "'It was the robin who showed me the way,' she protested obstinately. "'He didn't know he was doing it, but he did. And I can't tell you from here while you're shaking your fist at me.' He stopped shaking his fist very suddenly at that very moment, and his jaw actually dropped as he stared over her head at something he saw coming over the grass toward him. At the first sound of his torrent of words Colin had been so surprised that he had only sat up and listened as if he were spellbound. But in the midst of it he had recovered himself, and beckoned imperiously to Dickon. "'Wheel me over there,' he commanded. "'Wheel me quite close and stop right in front of him.' And this, if you please, this is what Ben Weatherstaff beheld, and which made his jaw drop. 
a wheeled chair with luxurious cushions and robes which came toward him looking rather like some sort of state coach, because a young Raja leaned back in it with royal command in his great black-rimmed eyes, and a thin white hand extended haughtily toward him. And it stopped right under Ben Weatherstaff's nose. It was really no wonder his mouth dropped open. "'Do you know who I am?' demanded the Raja. How Ben Weatherstaff stared! His red old eyes fixed themselves on what was before him as if he were seeing a ghost. He gazed and gazed, and gulped a lump down his throat and did not say a word. "'Do you know who I am?' demanded Colin, still more imperiously. Answer. Ben Weatherstaff put his gnarled hand up, and passed it over his eyes and over his forehead, and then he did answer in a queer, shaky voice. "'Who the art?' he said. "'Ay, that I do, with a mother's eyes staring at me out of the face. Lord knows how the come here, but the art the poor cripple.' Colin forgot that he had ever had a back. His face flushed scarlet, and he sat bolt upright. "'I'm not a cripple!' he cried out furiously. "'I'm not!' "'He's not!' cried Mary, almost shouting up the wall in her fierce indignation. "'He's not got a lump as big as a pin. I looked, and there was none there, not one!' Ben Weatherstaff passed his hand over his forehead again, and gazed as if he could never gaze enough. His hand shook, and his mouth shook, and his voice shook. He was an ignorant old man, and a tactless old man, and he could only remember the things he had heard. "'The... the hasn't got a crooked back?' he said hoarsely. "'No!' shouted Colin. "'The... the hasn't got crooked legs?' quavered Ben, more hoarsely yet. It was too much. The strength which Colin usually threw into his tantrums rushed through him now in a new way. Never yet had he been accused of crooked legs, even in whispers, and the perfectly simple belief in their existence which was revealed by Ben Weatherstaff's voice was more than Rajah flesh and blood could endure. His anger and insulted pride made him forget everything but this one moment, and filled him with a power he had never known before, an almost unnatural strength. "'Come here!' he shouted to Dickon, and he actually began to tear the coverings off his lower limbs and disentangle himself. "'Come here! Come here this minute!' Dickon was by his side in a second. Mary caught her breath in a short gasp, and felt herself turn pale. "'He can do it! He can do it! He can do it! He can!' she gabbled over to herself under her breath as fast as ever she could. There was a brief, fierce scramble. The rugs were tossed on the ground, Dickon held Colin's arm, the thin legs were out, the thin feet were on the grass. Colin was standing upright, upright, as straight as an arrow and looking strangely tall, his head thrown back, and his strange eyes flashing lightning. "'Look at me!' he flung up at Ben Weatherstaff. "'Just look at me, you! Just look at me!' "'He's as straight as I am!' cried Dickon. "'He's as straight as any lad of Yorkshire!' What Ben Weatherstaff did, Mary thought queer beyond measure. He choked and gulped, and suddenly tears ran down his weather-wrinkled cheeks as he struck his old hands together. "'Eh!' he burst forth. "'The lies folk tells. Thou art as thin as a lath, and as white as a wraith, but there's not a knob on thee. Thou'lt make a man yet. God bless thee!' Dickon held Colin's arm strongly, but the boy had not begun to falter. He stood straighter and straighter, and looked Ben Weatherstaff in the face. "'I'm your master,' he said, "'when my father is away, and you are to obey me. This is my garden. Don't dare to say a word about it. You get down from that ladder and go out to the long walk, and Miss Mary will meet you and bring you here. I want to talk to you. 
"'We did not want you, but now you will have to be in the secret. "'Be quick!' "'Ben Weatherstaff's crabbed old face was still wet "'with that one queer rush of tears. "'It seemed as if he could not take his eyes "'from thin, straight Colin standing on his feet "'with his head thrown back. "'Eh, lad!' he almost whispered. "'Eh, my lad!' "'And then, remembering himself, "'he suddenly touched his hat, gardener fashion, "'and said, "'Yes, sir, yes, sir!' and obediently disappeared as he descended the ladder. End of chapter 21 Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 13, 2006 in Oceanside, California This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. Chapter 22 When the Sun Went Down. When his head was out of sight, Colin turned to Mary. Go and meet him, he said, and Mary flew across the grass to the door under the ivy. Dickon was watching him with sharp eyes. There were scarlet spots on his cheeks, and he looked amazing, but he showed no signs of falling. "'I can stand,' he said, and his head was still held up, and he said it quite grandly. "'I told thee thou could as soon as thou stopped being afraid,' answered Dickon, and thou stopped. "'Yes, I've stopped,' said Colin." Then suddenly he remembered something Mary had said. "'Are you making magic?' he asked sharply. Dickens' curly mouth spread in a cheerful grin. "'Thou's doin' magic thysel,' he said. "'It's same magic as made these ear work out of the earth.' And he touched with his thick boot a clump of crocuses in the grass. Colin looked down at them. "'Aye,' he said slowly, "'there couldna be bigger magic than that there. "'There couldna be.' "'He drew himself up straighter than ever. "'I'm going to walk to that tree,' he said, "'pointing to one a few feet away from him. "'I'm going to be standing when Weatherstaff comes here. "'I can rest against the tree if I like. "'When I want to sit down, I will sit down, but not before.' "'Bring a rug from the chair.' "'He walked to the tree, "'and though Dickon held his arm, "'he was wonderfully steady. "'When he stood against the tree-trunk, "'it was not too plain "'that he supported himself against it, "'and he still held himself so straight "'that he looked tall. "'When Ben Weatherstaff came through the door in the wall, "'he saw him standing there, "'and he heard Mary muttering something under her breath. "'What art sayin'? he asked, rather testily, because he did not want his attention distracted from the long, thin, straight boy figure and proud face. But she did not tell him. What she was saying was this. "'You can do it! You can do it! I told you you could! You can do it! You can do it! You can!' She was saying it to Colin because she wanted to make magic and keep him on his feet looking like that. She could not bear that he should give in before Ben Weatherstaff. He did not give in. She was uplifted by a sudden feeling that he looked quite beautiful in spite of his thinness. He fixed his eyes on Ben Weatherstaff in his funny, imperious way. "'Look at me,' he commanded. "'Look at me all over. Am I a hunchback? Have I got crooked legs?' Ben Weatherstaff had not quite got over his emotion, but he had recovered a little, and answered almost in his usual way. "'Not tha,' he said. "'Now to the sort. What's tha been doin' with thy cell, hidin' out o' sight, and lettin' folk think tha was cripple and half-witted?' "'Half-witted?' said Colin angrily. "'Who thought that?' "'Lots of fools,' said Ben. 
The world's full o' jackasses brayin, and they never bray nout but lies. What did the shut thyself up for? Every one thought I was going to die, said Colin shortly. I'm not. And he said it with such decision, Ben Weatherstaff looked him over up and down, down and up. The die, he said with dry exultation. Now to the sort. Thou's got too much pluck in thee. When I seed thee put thy legs on the ground in such a hurry, I knowed thou was all right. Sit thee down on the rug a bit, young mester, and give me thy orders. There was a queer mixture of crabbed tenderness and shrewd understanding in his manner. Mary had poured out speech as rapidly as she could as they had come down the long walk. The chief thing to be remembered, she had told him. Was that Colin was getting well, getting well. The garden was doing it. No one must let him remember about having humps and dying. The Rajah condescended to seat himself on a rug under the tree. What work do you do in the gardens, Weatherstaff? he inquired. Anything I'm told to do, answered old Ben. I'm kept on by favour because she liked me. She said, Colin. The mother, answered Ben Weatherstaff. My mother, said Colin. And he looked about him quietly. This was her garden, wasn't it? Aye, it was that. And Ben Weatherstaff looked about him too. She were main fond of it. It is my garden now. I am fond of it. I shall come here every day, announced Colin. But it is to be a secret. My orders are that no one is to know that we come here. Dickon and my cousin have worked and made it come alive. I shall send for you sometimes to help, but you must come when no one can see you. Ben Weatherstaff's face twisted itself in a dry old smile. I've come here before when no one saw me, he said. What? exclaimed Colin. When? The last time I was here, rubbing his chin and looking round, was about two year ago. But no one has been in it for ten years, cried Colin. There was no door. I'm no one, said old Ben dryly, and I didn't come through the door. I come over the wall. The rheumatics held me back the last two year. The common did a bit of prunin, cried Dickon. I couldn't make out how it had been done. She was so fond of it, she was, said Ben Weatherstaff slowly. And she was such a pretty young thing. She says to me once, Ben, she says, laughing, if ever I'm ill or if I go away, you must take care of my roses. When she did go away, the orders was no one was ever to come nigh. But I come, with grumpy obstinacy, over the wall I come, until the rheumatics stopped me, and I did a bit of work once a year. She'd gave her order first. It wouldn't have been as wick as it is if I hadn't done it, said Dickon. I did wonder. I'm glad you did it, Weatherstaff, said Colin. You'll know how to keep the secret. Ay, I'll know, sir. Answered Ben, and it'll be easier for a man wi' rheumatics to come in at the door. On the grass near the tree, Mary had dropped her trowel. Colin stretched out his hand and took it up. An odd expression came into his face, and he began to scratch at the earth. His thin hand was weak enough, but presently, as they watched him, Mary, with quite breathless interest, he drove the end of the trowel into the soil and turned some over. You can do it, you can do it, said Mary to herself. I tell you, you can. Dickens' round eyes were full of eager curiousness, but he said not a word. Ben Weatherstaff looked on with interested face. Colin persevered. After he had turned a few trowelfuls of soil, he spoke exultantly to Dickon in his best Yorkshire. 
Thus said, as thou'd have me walkin' about here same as other folk, and thus said thou'd have me diggin'. I thought thou was just leein' to please me. This is only the first day, and I've walked, and here I am diggin'. Ben Weatherstaff's mouth fell open again when he heard him, but he ended by chuckling. Eh, he said, that sounds as if thou'd got wits enow. Thou'rt a Yorkshire lad for sure, and thou art diggin' too. How'd thou like to plant a bit o' something? I can get thee a rose in a pot. Go and get it, said Colin, digging excitedly. Quick, quick! It was done quickly enough indeed. Ben Weatherstaff went his way, forgetting rheumatics. Dickon took his spade and dug the hole deeper and wider than a new digger with thin white hands could make it. Mary slipped out to run and bring back a watering can. When Dickon had deepened the hole, Colin went on turning the soft earth over and over. He looked up at the sky, flushed and glowing with the strangely new exercise, slight as it was. I want to do it before the sun goes quite, quite down, he said. Mary thought that perhaps the sun held back a few minutes, just on purpose. Ben Weatherstaff brought the rose in its pot from the greenhouse. He hobbled over the grass as fast as he could. He had begun to be excited, too. He knelt down by the hole and broke the pot from the mould. Here, lad, he said. "'handing the plant to Colin. "'Set it in the earth thyself, same as the king does when he goes to a new place.' "'The thin white hands shook a little, "'and Colin's flush grew deeper as he set the rose in the mould "'and held it while old Ben made firm the earth. "'It was filled in and pressed down and made steady. "'Mary was leaning forward on her hands and knees.' Soot had flown down and marched forward to see what was being done. Nut and shell chattered about it from a cherry tree. "'It's planted,' said Colin at last, "'and the sun is only slipping over the edge. Help me up, Dickon. I want to be standing when it goes. That's part of the magic.' And Dickon helped him, and the magic, or whatever it was, so gave him strength that when the sun did slip over the edge and end the strange, lovely afternoon for them, there he actually stood on his two feet, laughing. End of chapter 22 Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 16th, 2006 In Oceanside, California This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. Chapter 23 Magic. Dr. Craven had been waiting some time at the house when they returned to it. He had indeed begun to wonder if it might not be wise to send someone out to explore the garden paths. When Colin was brought back to his room, the poor man looked him over seriously. "'You should not have stayed so long,' he said. "'You must not overexert yourself.' "'I am not tired at all,' said Colin. "'It has made me well.' "'Tomorrow I am going out in the morning as well as in the afternoon.' "'I am not sure that I can allow it,' answered Dr. Craven. "'I am afraid it would not be wise.' "'It would not be wise to try to stop me,' said Colin quite seriously. "'I am going.' Even Mary had found out that one of Colin's chief peculiarities was that he did not know in the least what a rude little brute he was, with his way of ordering people about. He had lived on a sort of desert island all his life, and as he had been the king of it, he had made his own manners, and had had no one to compare himself with. Mary had indeed been rather like him herself, 
and since she had been at Misselthwaite, had gradually discovered that her own manners had not been of the kind which is usual or popular. Having made this discovery, she naturally thought it of enough interest to communicate to Colin. So she sat and looked at him curiously for a few minutes after Dr. Craven had gone. She wanted to make him ask her why she was doing it, and of course she did. "'What are you looking at me for?' he said. "'I'm thinking that I am rather sorry for Dr. Craven.' "'So am I,' said Colin calmly, but not without an air of some satisfaction. "'He won't get Misselthwaite at all, now I'm not going to die.' "'I'm sorry for him because of that, of course,' said Mary. "'But I was thinking just then that it must have been very horrid to have had to be polite for ten years to a boy who was always rude. I would never have done it. "'Am I rude?' Colin inquired undisturbedly. "'If you had been his own boy, and he had been a slapping sort of man,' said Mary, "'he would have slapped you.' "'But he daren't,' said Colin. "'No, he daren't,' answered Mistress Mary, thinking the thing out quite without prejudice. Nobody ever dared to do anything you didn't like, because you were going to die and things like that. You were such a poor thing. But, announced Colin stubbornly, I am not going to be a poor thing. I won't let people think I'm one. I stood on my feet this afternoon. It is always having your own way that has made you so queer, Mary went on, thinking aloud. Colin turned his head, frowning. "'Am I queer?' he demanded. "'Yes,' answered Mary. "'Very. But you needn't be cross,' she added impartially. "'Because so am I queer, and so is Ben Weatherstaff. But I am not as queer as I was before I began to like people, and before I found the garden.' "'I don't want to be queer,' said Colin. "'I am not going to be.' And he frowned again with determination." He was a very proud boy. He lay thinking for a while, and then Mary saw his beautiful smile begin, and gradually change his whole face. "'I shall stop being queer,' he said, "'if I go every day to the garden. There is magic in there, good magic, you know, Mary. I am sure there is.' "'So am I,' said Mary. "'Even if it isn't real magic,' Colin said. We can pretend it is. Something is there. Something. It's magic, said Mary, but not black. It's as white as snow. They always called it magic. And indeed it seemed like it in the months that followed, the wonderful months, the radiant months, the amazing ones. Oh, the things which happened in that garden— if you have never had a garden, you cannot understand, and if you have had a garden, you will know that it would take a whole book to describe all that came to pass there. At first it seemed that green things would never cease pushing their way through the earth, in the grass, in the beds, even in the crevices of the walls. Then the green things began to show buds, and the buds began to unfurl and show color, every shade of blue, every shade of purple, every tint and hue of crimson. In its happy days flowers had been tucked away into every inch and hole and corner. Ben Weatherstaff had seen it done, and had himself scraped out mortar from between the bricks of the wall, and made pockets of earth for lovely clinging things to grow on. Iris and white lilies rose out of the grass in sheaves, and the green alcoves filled themselves with amazing armies of the blue and white flower lances of tall delphiniums, or columbines, or campanulas. She was main fond of them, she was, Ben Weatherstaff said. She liked them things as was always pointin' up to the blue sky, she used to tell. Not as she was one of them as looked down on the earth, not her. She just loved it, but she said as the blue sky allus looks so joyful. 
The seeds Dickon and Mary had planted grew as if fairies had tended them. Satiny poppies of all tints danced in the breeze by the score, gaily defying flowers which had lived in the garden for years, and which, it might be confessed, seemed rather to wonder how such new people had got there. And the roses, the roses, rising out of the grass, tangled round the sundial, wreathing the tree trunks and hanging from their branches, climbing up the walls and spreading over them with long garlands falling in cascades. They came alive day by day, hour by hour. Fair fresh leaves and buds and buds, tiny at first, but swelling and working magic until they burst and uncurled into cups of scent, delicately spilling themselves over their brims and filling the garden air. Colin saw it all, watching each change as it took place. Every morning he was brought out, and every hour of each day, when it didn't rain, he spent in the garden. Even grey days pleased him. He would lie on the grass, watching things growing, he said. If you watched long enough, he declared, you could see buds unsheath themselves. Also you could make the acquaintance of strange, busy insect things, running about on various unknown but evidently serious errands, sometimes carrying tiny scraps of straw, or feather, or food, or climbing blades of grass as if they were trees, from whose tops one could look out to explore the country. A mole throwing up its mound at the end of its burrow, and making its way out at last, with the long-nailed paws which looked so like elfish hands, had absorbed him one whole morning. Ants' ways, beetles' ways, bees' ways, frogs' ways, birds' ways, plants' ways, gave him a new world to explore, and when Dickon revealed them all and added foxes' ways, otters' ways, ferrets' ways, squirrels' ways, and trout and water rats and badgers' ways, there was no end of things to talk about and think over. And this was not the half of the magic. The fact that he had really once stood on his feet had set Colin thinking tremendously, and when Mary told him of the spell she had worked he was excited, and approved of it greatly. He talked of it constantly. "'Of course there must be lots of magic in the world,' he said wisely one day. "'But people don't know what it is like, or how to make it. Perhaps the beginning is just to say nice things are going to happen, until you make them happen. I am going to try and experiment.' The next morning, when they went to the secret garden, he sent at once for Ben Weatherstaff. Ben came as quickly as he could, and found the Rajah standing on his feet under a tree, and looking very grand, but also very beautifully smiling. "'Good morning, Ben Weatherstaff,' he said. "'I want you, and Dickon, and Miss Mary to stand in a row and listen to me, because I am going to tell you something very important.' "'Aye, aye, sir,' answered Ben Weatherstaff, touching his forehead. One of the long-concealed charms of Ben Weatherstaff was that in his boyhood he had once run away to sea, and had made voyages, so he could reply like a sailor. "'I am going to try a scientific experiment,' explained the Rajah. "'When I grow up I am going to make great scientific discoveries,' and I am going to begin now with this experiment. "'Aye, aye, sir,' said Ben Weatherstaff promptly, though this was the first time he had heard of great scientific discoveries. It was the first time Mary had heard of them either, but even at this stage she had begun to realize that, queer as he was, Colin had read about a great many singular things, and was somehow a very convincing sort of boy. When he held up his head and fixed his strange eyes on you, it seemed as if you believed him almost in spite of yourself, though he was only ten years old, going on eleven. 
At this moment he was especially convincing, because he suddenly felt the fascination of actually making a sort of speech, like a grown-up person. "'The great scientific discoveries I am going to make,' he went on, "'will be about magic. Magic is a great thing, and scarcely anyone knows anything about it, except a few people in old books, and Mary a little, because she was born in India, where there are fakirs. I believe Dickon knows some magic, but perhaps he doesn't know he knows it. He charms animals and people. I would never have let him come to see me if he had not been an animal charmer, which is a boy charmer, too, because a boy is an animal. I am sure there is magic in everything, only we have not sense enough to get hold of it and make it do things for us, like electricity and horses and steam. This sounded so imposing that Ben Weatherstaff became quite excited, and really could not keep still. "'Ay, ay, sir,' he said, and he began to stand up quite straight. "'When Mary found this garden, it looked quite dead,' the orator proceeded. "'Then something began pushing things up out of the soil, and making things out of nothing. One day things weren't there, and another they were.' I had never watched things before, and it made me feel very curious. Scientific people are always curious, and I am going to be scientific. I keep saying to myself, What is it? What is it? It's something. It can't be nothing. I don't know its name, so I call it magic. I have never seen the sunrise, but Mary and Dickon have, and from what they tell me I am sure that is magic, too. Something pushes it up and draws it. Sometimes, since I've been in the garden, I've looked up through the trees at the sky, and I have had a strange feeling of being happy, as if something were pushing and drawing in my chest, and making me breathe fast. Magic is always pushing and drawing and making things out of nothing. Everything is made out of magic, leaves and trees, flowers and birds, badgers and foxes and squirrels and people. So it must be all around us, in this garden, in all the places. The magic in this garden has made me stand up and know I am going to live to be a man. I am going to make the scientific experiment of trying to get some and put it in myself and make it push and draw me and make me strong. I don't know how to do it, but I think that if you keep thinking about it and calling it, perhaps it will come. Perhaps that is the first baby way to get it. When I was going to try to stand that first time, Mary kept saying to herself as fast as she could, You can do it, you can do it. And I did. I had to try myself at the same time, of course, but her magic helped me, and so did Dickens. Every morning and evening, and as often in the daytime as I can remember, I am going to say, Magic is in me. Magic is making me well. I am going to be as strong as Dickon, as strong as Dickon. And you must all do it too. That is my experiment. Will you help, Ben Weatherstaff? Ay, ay, sir, said Ben Weatherstaff. Ay, ay. If you keep doing it every day as regularly as soldiers go through drill, we shall see what will happen and find out if the experiment succeeds. You learn things by saying them over and over and thinking about them until they stay in your mind forever, and I think it will be the same with magic. If you keep calling it to come to you and help you, it will get to be part of you, and it will stay and do things. I once heard an officer in India tell my mother that there were fakirs who said words over and over thousands of times, said Mary. I've heard Jem Fettleworth's wife say the same thing over thousands of times, callin' Jem a drunken brute, said Ben Weatherstaff dryly. Summit allus comes o' that, sure enough. He gave her a good hidin' and went to the Blue Lion and got as drunk as a lord. Colin drew his brows together and thought a few minutes. Then he cheered up. Well, he said, you see, something did come of it. She used the wrong magic until she made him beat her. If she'd used the right magic and had said something nice, 
perhaps he wouldn't have got as drunk as a lord, and perhaps, perhaps he might have bought her a new bonnet. Ben Weatherstaff chuckled, and there was shrewd admiration in his little old eyes. "'Thou'rt a clever lad as well as a straight-legged one, Mr. Collin,' he said. "'Next time I see Bess Fettleworth I'll give her a bit of a hint of what magic will do for her. She'd be rare and pleased if the scientific experiment worked, and so a gem. Dickon had stood listening to the lecture, his round eyes shining with curious delight. Nut and shell were on his shoulders, and he held a long-eared white rabbit in his arm, and stroked and stroked it softly, while it laid its ears along its back, and enjoyed itself. "'Do you think the experiment will work?' Colin asked him, wondering what he was thinking. He so often wondered what Dickon was thinking when he saw him looking at him or at one of his creatures with his happy wide smile. He smiled now, and his smile was wider than usual. "'Aye,' he answered, "'that I do. It'll work same as the seeds do when the sun shines on em. It'll work for sure. Shall us begin it now?' Colin was delighted, and so was Mary. Fired by recollections of fakirs and devotees in illustrations, Colin suggested that they should all sit cross-legged under the tree, which made a canopy. "'It will be like sitting in a sort of temple,' said Colin. "'I'm rather tired, and I want to sit down.' "'Eh,' said Dickon, "'the mustn't begin by saying thou art tired. The might spoil the magic.' Colin turned and looked at him, into his innocent round eyes. "'That's true,' he said slowly. "'I must only think of the magic.' It all seemed most majestic and mysterious when they sat down in their circle. Ben Weatherstaff felt as if he had somehow been led into appearing at a prayer-meeting. Ordinarily he was very fixed in being what he called, "'Again prayer meetings. But this being the Rajah's affair, he did not resent it, and was indeed inclined to be gratified at being called upon to assist. Mistress Mary felt solemnly enraptured. Dickon held his rabbit in his arm, and perhaps he made some charmer's signal no one heard, for when he sat down, cross-legged like the rest, the crow, the fox, the squirrels, and the lamb slowly drew near and made part of the circle. "'settling each into a place of rest, as if of their own desire. "'The creatures have come,' said Colin gravely. "'They want to help us.' "'Colin really looked quite beautiful,' Mary thought. "'He held his head high as if he felt like a sort of priest, "'and his strange eyes had a wonderful look in them. "'The light shone on him through the tree canopy.' "'Now we will begin,' he said. "'Shall we sway backward and forward, Mary, as if we were dervishes?' "'I canna do no swayin' backward and forward,' said Ben Weatherstaff. "'I've got the rheumatics.' "'The magic will take them away,' said Colin, in a high priest tone. "'But we won't sway until it has done it. We will only chant.' "'I canna do no chantin.' said Ben Weatherstaff, a trifle testily. They turned me out of the church choir the only time I ever tried it. No one smiled. They were all too much in earnest. Colin's face was not even crossed by a shadow. He was thinking only of the magic. Then I will chant, he said. And he began, looking like a strange boy spirit. The sun is shining. The sun is shining. That is the magic. The flowers are growing. The roots are stirring. That is the magic. Being alive is the magic. Being strong is the magic. The magic is in me. The magic is in me. It is in me. It is in me. It's in every one of us. It's in Ben Weatherstaff's back. Magic, magic, come and help. He said it a great many times. Not a thousand times, but quite a goodly number. Mary listened entranced. 
She felt as if it were at once queer and beautiful, and she wanted him to go on and on. Ben Weatherstaff began to feel soothed into a sort of dream which was quite agreeable. The humming of the bees in the blossoms mingled with the chanting voice, and drowsily melted into a doze. Dickon sat cross-legged with his rabbit asleep on his arm, and a hand resting on the lamb's back. Soot had pushed away a squirrel, and huddled close to him on his shoulder. The grey film dropped over his eyes. At last Colin stopped. "'Now I am going to walk round the garden,' he announced. Ben Weatherstaff's head had just dropped forward, and he lifted it with a jerk. "'You have been asleep,' said Colin. "'Now to the sort,' mumbled Ben. "'The sermon was good enow, but I'm bound to get out afore the collection.' He was not quite awake yet. "'You're not in church,' said Colin. "'Not me,' said Ben, straightening himself. "'Who said I were? I heard every bit of it. You said the magic was in my back. The doctor calls it rheumatics.' The Rajah waved his hand. "'That was the wrong magic,' he said. "'You will get better. You have my permission to go to your work. But come back to-morrow.' "'I'd like to see thee walk round the garden,' grunted Ben. It was not an unfriendly grunt, but it was a grunt. In fact, being a stubborn old party, and not having entire faith in magic, he had made up his mind that if he were sent away he would climb his ladder, and look over the wall, so that he might be ready to hobble back, if there were any stumbling. The Rajah did not object to his staying, and so the procession was formed. It really did look like a procession. Colin was at its head, with Dickon on one side, and Mary on the other. Ben Weatherstaff walked behind, and the creatures trailed after them, the lamb and the fox-cub keeping close to Dickon, the white rabbit hopping along or stopping to nibble, and Soot following with the solemnity of a person who felt himself in charge. It was a procession which moved slowly, but with dignity. Every few yards it stopped to rest. Colin leaned on Dickens' arm, and privately Ben Weatherstaff kept a sharp lookout, but now and then Colin took his hand from its support and walked a few steps alone. His head was held up all the time, and he looked very grand. "'The magic is in me,' he kept saying. "'The magic is making me strong. I can feel it. I can feel it.' It seemed very certain that something was upholding and uplifting him. He sat on the seats in the alcoves, and once or twice he sat down on the grass, and several times he paused in the path and leaned on Dickon but he would not give up until he had gone all round the garden. When he returned to the canopy-tree, his cheeks were flushed, and he looked triumphant. "'I did it! The magic worked!' he cried. "'That is my first scientific discovery!' "'What will Dr. Craven say?' broke out Mary. "'He won't say anything,' Colin answered, "'because he will not be told.' This is to be the biggest secret of all. No one is to know anything about it until I have grown so strong that I can walk and run like any other boy. I shall come here every day in my chair, and I shall be taken back in it. I won't have people whispering and asking questions, and I won't let my father hear about it until the experiment has quite succeeded. Then, some time when he comes back to Misselthwaite, I shall just walk into his study and say, Here I am. I am like any other boy. I am quite well, and I shall live to be a man. It has been done by a scientific experiment. He will think he is in a dream, cried Mary. He won't believe his eyes. Colin flushed triumphantly. He had made himself believe that he was going to get well, which was really more than half the battle, if he had been aware of it. And the thought which stimulated him more than any other was this imagining what his father would look like when he saw that he had a son who was as straight and strong 
as other fathers' sons. One of his darkest miseries in the unhealthy, morbid past days had been his hatred of being a sickly, weak-backed boy whose father was afraid to look at him. "'He'll be obliged to believe them,' he said. "'One of the things I am going to do, after the magic works and before I begin to make scientific discoveries, is to be an athlete.' "'We shall have thee taken to boxin' in a week or so,' said Ben Weatherstaff. "'Thalt end wi' winnin' the belt, and bein' champion prize-fighter of all England.' Colin fixed his eyes on him sternly. "'Weatherstaff,' he said, "'that is disrespectful. You must not take liberties because you are in the secret. However much the magic works, I shall not be a prize-fighter. I shall be a scientific discoverer.' "'Ax pardon, ax pardon, sir,' answered Ben, touching his forehead in salute. "'I ought to have seed it wasn't a jokin' matter.' But his eyes twinkled, and secretly he was immensely pleased. He really did not mind being snubbed, since the snubbing meant that the lad was gaining strength and spirit. End of chapter 23 Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 16th 2006, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. THE SECRET GARDEN by Francis Hodgson Burnett CHAPTER Twenty Four. LET THEM LAUGH The secret garden was not the only one Dickon worked in. Round the cottage on the moor there was a piece of ground enclosed by a low wall of rough stones. Early in the morning, and late in the fading twilight, and on all the days Colin and Mary did not see him, Dickon worked there, planting or tending potatoes and cabbages, turnips and carrots and herbs for his mother. In the company of his creatures he did wonders there, and was never tired of doing them, it seemed. While he dug or weeded, he whistled or sang bits of Yorkshire moor songs, or talked to Soot or Captain, or the brothers and sisters he had taught to help him. "'We'd never get on as comfortable as we do,' Mrs. Sowerby said. "'if it wasn't for Dickens' garden. "'Anything'll grow for him. "'His taters and cabbages is twice the size of anyone else's, "'and they've got a flavour with them as nobody's has.' "'When she found a moment to spare, "'she liked to go out and talk to him. "'After supper there was still a long, clear twilight to work in, "'and that was her quiet time. "'She could sit upon the low, rough wall "'and look on and hear stories of the day.' She loved this time. There were not only vegetables in this garden. Dickon had bought penny packages of flower seeds now and then, and sown bright, sweet-scented things among gooseberry bushes and even cabbages, and he grew borders of mignonette and pinks and pansies, and things whose seeds he could save year after year, or whose roots would bloom each spring and spread in time into fine clumps. The low wall was one of the prettiest things in Yorkshire, because he had tucked moorland foxglove and ferns and rock-cress and hedgerow flowers into every crevice, until only here and there glimpses of the stones were to be seen. "'All a chap's got to do to make em thrive, mother,' he would say, "'is to be friends with em for sure. They're just like the creatures. If they're thirsty, give em drink.' "'and if they're hungry, give em a bit of food. "'They want to live, same as we do. "'If they died, I should feel as if I'd been a bad lad, "'and somehow treated them heartless. "'It was in these twilight hours "'that Mrs. Sowerby heard of all that happened at Misselthwaite Manor. "'At first she was only told that Mr. Collin "'had taken a fancy to going out into the grounds with Miss Mary, "'and that it was doing him good.' but it was not long before it was agreed between the two children that Dickens' mother might come into the secret. Somehow it was not doubted that she was safe for sure. 
So, one beautiful still evening, Dickon told the whole story, with all the thrilling details of the buried key, and the robin, and the grey haze which had seemed like deadness, and the secret Miss Mary had planned never to reveal. The coming of Dickon, and how it had been told to him, the doubt of Mr. Collin, and the final drama of his introduction to the hidden domain, combined with the incident of Ben Weatherstaff's angry face peering over the wall, and Mr. Collin's sudden, indignant strength, made Mrs. Sowerby's nice-looking face quite change colour several times. "'My word!' she said. "'It was a good thing that little lass came to the manor. It's been the makin' o' her and the savin' o' him. Standin' on his feet, and us all thinkin' he was a poor half-witted lad, with not a straight bone in him. She asked a great many questions, and her blue eyes were full of deep thinking. "'What do they make of it at the manor, him bein' so well and cheerful, and never complainin?' she inquired. "'They don't know what to make of it,' answered Dickon. "'Every day as comes round his face looks different. It's fillin' out, and doesn't look so sharp, and the waxy colour is goin'. But he has to do his bit o' complainin.' with a highly entertained grin. "'What for, in mercy's name?' asked Mrs. Sowerby. Dickon chuckled. "'He does it to keep them from guessin' what's happened. If the doctor knew he'd found out he could stand on his feet, he'd likely write and tell Mr. Craven. Mr. Collins savin' the secret to tell himself. He's goin' to practice his magic on his legs every day till his father comes back, and then he's going to march into his room, and show him he's as straight as other lads. But him and Miss Mary thinks it's best plan to do a bit of groanin' and frettin' now and then, to throw folk off the scent. Mrs. Sowerby was laughing a low, comfortable laugh long before he had finished his last sentence. "Eh," hey, she said, that pairs enjoyin' theirselves, I'll warrant. They'll get a good bit of actin' out of it, and there's nothin' children likes as much as play actin'. Let's hear what they do, Dickon lad. Dickon stopped weeding, and sat up on his heels to tell her. His eyes were twinkling with fun. Mr. Collin is carried down to his chair every time he goes out, he explained, and he flies out at John, the footman, for not carrying him careful enough. He makes himself as helpless lookin' as he can, and never lifts his head until we're out o' sight of the house. And he grunts and frets a good bit when he's being settled into his chair. Him and Miss Mary's both got to enjoyin' it, and when he groans and complains, she'll say, "'Poor Colin, does it hurt you so much? Are you so weak as that, poor Colin?' But the trouble is that sometimes they can scarce keep from bursting out laughin'. When we get safe into the garden, they laugh till they've no breath left to laugh with, and they have to stuff their faces into Mester Collins' cushions to keep the gardeners from hearin', if any of em's about. "'The more they laugh, the better for em,' said Mrs. Sowerby, still laughing herself. "'Good, healthy child laughin's better than pills any day of the year. That pair'll plump up for sure.' "'They are plumpin' up,' said Dickon. They're that hungry they don't know how to get enough to eat without making talk. Mr. Collins says if he keeps sendin' for more food, they won't believe he's an invalid at all. Miss Mary says she'll let him eat her share, but he says that if she goes hungry she'll get thin, and they mun both get fat at once. Mrs. Sowerby laughed so heartily at the revelation of this difficulty that she quite rocked backward and forward in her blue cloak, and Dickon laughed with her. "'I'll tell thee what, lad,' Mrs. Sowerby said, when she could speak. "'I've thought of a way to help em. "'When the goes to em in the mornings, "'thou shall take a pail o' good new milk, "'and I'll bake em a crusty cottage loaf, "'or some buns wi' currants in em, "'same as you children like. "'Nothin' so good as fresh milk and bread. "'Then they could take the edge off o' their hunger "'while they were in their garden, "'and the fine food they get indoors "'ud polish off the corners.' "'Eh, mother,' said Dickon, admiringly, "'what a wonder the art! "'Thou always sees a way out o' things. "'They was quite in a pother yesterday. 
They didn't see how they was to manage without order and up more food. They felt that empty inside. They're two young uns growing fast, and health's coming back to both of em. Children like that feels like young wolves, and food's flesh and blood to em, said Mrs. Sowerby. Then she smiled Dickens' own curving smile. Eh, but they're enjoying themselves for sure, she said. She was quite right, the comfortable, wonderful mother creature, and she had never been more so than when she said their play actin' would be their joy. Colin and Mary found it one of their most thrilling sources of entertainment. The idea of protecting themselves from suspicion had been unconsciously suggested to them first by the puzzled nurse, and then by Dr. Craven himself. "'Your appetite is improving very much, Master Colin,' the nurse had said one day. "'You used to eat nothing, and so many things disagreed with you.' "'Nothing disagrees with me now,' replied Colin, and then, seeing the nurse looking at him curiously, he suddenly remembered that perhaps he ought not to appear too well just yet. "'At least things don't so often disagree with me. It's the fresh air.' "'Perhaps it is,' said the nurse, still looking at him with a mystified expression. "'But I must talk to Dr. Craven about it.' "'How she stared at you,' said Mary, when she went away, "'as if she thought there must be something to find out. "'I won't have her finding out things,' said Colin. "'No one must begin to find out yet.' "'When Dr. Craven came that morning, he seemed puzzled also. "'He asked a number of questions, to Colin's great annoyance. "'You stay out in the garden a great deal,' he suggested. "'Where do you go?' Colin put on his favourite air of dignified indifference to opinion. "'I will not let any one know where I go,' he answered. "'I go to a place I like. Every one has orders to keep out of the way. I won't be watched and stared at. You know that.' "'You seem to be out all day, but I do not think it has done you harm. I do not think so. The nurse says that you eat much more than you have ever done before.' Perhaps, said Colin, prompted by a sudden inspiration, perhaps it is an unnatural appetite. I do not think so, as your food seems to agree with you, said Dr. Craven. You are gaining flesh rapidly, and your color is better. Perhaps, perhaps I am bloated and feverish, said Colin, assuming a discouraged air of gloom. People who are not going to live are often different. Dr. Craven shook his head. He was holding Colin's wrist, and he pushed up his sleeve and felt his arm. You are not feverish, he said thoughtfully, and such flesh as you have gained is healthy. If you can keep this up, my boy, we need not talk of dying. Your father will be happy to hear of this remarkable improvement. I won't have him told. "'Colin broke forth fiercely. "'It will only disappoint him if I get worse again, "'and I may get worse this very night. "'I might have a raging fever. "'I feel as if I might be beginning to have one now. "'I won't have letters written to my father. "'I won't, I won't. "'You are making me angry, and you know that is bad for me. "'I feel hot already. "'I hate being written about and being talked over "'as much as I hate being stared at.' "'Hush, my boy.' Dr. Craven soothed him. "'Nothing shall be written without your permission. You are too sensitive about things. You must not undo the good which has been done.' He said no more about writing to Mr. Craven, and when he saw the nurse he privately warned her that such a possibility must not be mentioned to the patient. "'The boy is extraordinarily better,' he said. "'His advance seems almost abnormal.' "'but of course he is doing now, of his own free will, "'what we could not make him do before. "'Still, he excites himself very easily, "'and nothing must be said to irritate him.' "'Mary and Colin were much alarmed, "'and talked together anxiously. "'From this time dated their plan of play-actin'. 
"'I may be obliged to have a tantrum,' said Colin regretfully. "'I don't want to have one, and I'm not miserable enough now to work myself into a big one. Perhaps I couldn't have one at all. That lump doesn't come in my throat now, and I keep thinking of nice things instead of horrible ones. But if they talk about writing to my father, I shall have to do something.' He made up his mind to eat less, but, unfortunately, it was not possible to carry out this brilliant idea when he wakened each morning with an amazing appetite, and the table near his sofa was set with a breakfast of home-made bread and fresh butter, snow-white eggs, raspberry jam, and clotted cream. Mary always breakfasted with him, and when they found themselves at the table— particularly if there were delicate slices of sizzling ham sending forth tempting odours from under a hot silver cover, they would look into each other's eyes in desperation. "'I think we shall have to eat it all this morning, Mary,' Colin always ended by saying. "'We can send away some of the lunch, and a great deal of the dinner.' But they never found they could send away anything— and the highly polished condition of the empty plates returned to the pantry awakened much comment. "'I do wish,' Colin would say also, "'I do wish the slices of ham were thicker, and one muffin each is not enough for any one.' "'It is enough for a person who is going to die,' answered Mary when first she heard this. "'But it's not enough for a person who is going to live.' I sometimes feel as if I could eat three when those nice fresh heather and gorse smells from the moor come pouring in at the open window. The morning that Dickon, after they had been enjoying themselves in the garden for about two hours, went behind a big rose-bush and brought forth two tin pails, and revealed that one was full of rich new milk with cream on the top of it, and that the other held cottage-made currant buns, folded in a clean blue-and-white napkin, buns so carefully tucked in that they were still hot, there was a riot of surprised joyfulness. What a wonderful thing for Mrs. Sowerby to think of! What a kind, clever woman she must be! How good the buns were, and what delicious fresh milk! "'Magic is in her, just as it is in Dickon,' said Colin. It makes her think of ways to do things, nice things. She is a magic person. Tell her we are grateful, Dickon, extremely grateful. He was given to using rather grown-up phrases at times. He enjoyed them. He liked this so much that he improved upon it. Tell her she has been most bounteous, and our gratitude is extreme. And then— Forgetting his grandeur, he fell to and stuffed himself with buns, and drank milk out of the pail in copious draughts, in the manner of any hungry little boy who had been taking unusual exercise, and breathing in moorland air, and whose breakfast was more than two hours behind him. This was the beginning of many agreeable incidents of the same kind. They actually awoke to the fact that as Mrs. Sowerby had fourteen people to provide food for, she might not have enough to satisfy two extra appetites every day. So they asked her to let them send some of their shillings to buy things. Dickon made the stimulating discovery that in the wood in the park outside the garden where Mary had first found him piping to the wild creatures, there was a deep little hollow where you could build a sort of tiny oven with stones, and roast potatoes and eggs in it. Roasted eggs were a previously unknown luxury, and very hot potatoes with salt and fresh butter in them were fit for a woodland king, besides being deliciously satisfying. You could buy both potatoes and eggs, and eat as many as you liked, without feeling as if you were taking food out of the mouths of fourteen people. Every beautiful morning the magic was worked by the mystic circle under the plum-tree which provided a canopy of thickening green leaves after its brief blossom-time was ended. After the ceremony Colin always took his walking exercise, and throughout the day he exercised his newly found power at intervals. Each day he grew stronger and could walk more steadily and cover more ground. 
and each day his belief in the magic grew stronger, as well it might. He tried one experiment after another, as he felt himself gaining strength, and it was Dickon who showed him the best things of all. Yesterday, he said one morning, after an absence, I went to Thwaite for mother, and near the Blue Cow Inn I seed Bob Hayworth. He's the strongest chap on the moor. He's the champion wrestler, and he can jump higher than any other chap, and throw the hammer farther. He's gone all the way to Scotland for the sports, some years. He's knowed me ever since I was a little un, and he's a friendly sort, and I axed him some questions. The gentry calls him a athlete, and I thought o' thee, Mr. Collin, and I says, How did they make the muscles stick out that way, Bob? Did they do anything extra to make thyself so strong? And he says, Well, yes, lad, I did. A strong man in a show that came to Thwaite once showed me how to exercise my arms and legs and every muscle in my body. And I says, Could a delicate chap make himself stronger with em, Bob? And he laughed and says, Art tha the delicate chap? And I says, No, but I knows a young gentleman that's getting well of a long illness, and I wish I knowed some of them tricks to tell him about. I didn't say no names, and he didn't ask none. He's friendly, same as I said, and he stood up and showed me good-natured like, and I imitated what he did till I knowed it by heart. Colin had been listening excitedly. Can you show me? he cried. Will you? Aye, to be sure, Dickon answered, getting up. But he says the mun do em gentle at first, and be careful not to tire thyself. Rest in between times, and take deep breaths, and don't overdo. I'll be careful, said Colin. Show me, show me. Dickon, you are the most magic boy in the world. Dickon stood up on the grass and slowly went through a carefully practical but simple series of muscle exercises. Colin watched them with widening eyes. He could do a few while he was sitting down. Presently he did a few gently while he stood upon his already steadied feet. Mary began to do them also. Soot, who was watching the performance, became much disturbed, and left his branch and hopped about restlessly, because he could not do them too. From that time the exercises were part of the day's duties as much as the magic was. It became possible for both Colin and Mary to do more of them each time they tried, and such appetites were the results that, but for the basket Dickon put down behind the bush each morning, when he arrived, they would have been lost. But the little oven in the hollow, and Mrs. Sowerby's bounties, were so satisfying that Mrs. Medlock and the nurse and Dr. Craven became mystified again. You can trifle with your breakfast, and seem to disdain your dinner, if you are full to the brim with roasted eggs and potatoes and richly frothed new milk and oat-cakes and buns and heather honey and clotted cream. "'They are eating next to nothing,' said the nurse. "'They'll die of starvation if they can't be persuaded to take some nourishment. And yet see how they look!' "'Look!' exclaimed Mrs. Medlock indignantly. "'Eh! I'm moithered to death with them. They're a pair of young Satans, bursting their jackets one day and the next, turning up their noses at the best meals cook can tempt them with. Not a mouthful of that lovely young fowl and bread sauce did they set a fork into yesterday, and the poor woman fair invented a pudding for them, and back it's sent. She almost cried. She's afraid she'll be blamed if they starve themselves into their graves. Dr. Craven came and looked at Colin long and carefully. He wore an extremely worried expression when the nurse talked with him, and showed him the almost untouched tray of breakfast she had saved for him to look at, but it was even more worried when he sat down by Colin's sofa and examined him. He had been called to London on business, and had not seen the boy for nearly two weeks. When young things begin to gain health, they gain it rapidly. The waxen tinge had left Colin's skin, and a warm rose showed through it. His beautiful eyes were clear, and the hollows under them and in his cheeks and temples had filled out. 
His once dark, heavy locks had begun to look as if they sprang healthily from his forehead, and were soft and warm with life. His lips were fuller and of a normal colour. In fact, as an imitation of a boy who was a confirmed invalid, he was a disgraceful sight. Dr. Craven held his chin in his hand and thought him over. "'I am sorry to hear that you do not eat anything,' he said. "'That will not do. You will lose all you have gained, and you have gained amazingly. You ate so well a short time ago.' "'I told you it was an unnatural appetite,' answered Colin. Mary was sitting on her stool near by, and she suddenly made a very queer sound, which she tried so violently to repress that she ended by almost choking. "'What is the matter?' said Dr. Craven, turning to look at her. Mary became quite severe in her manner. "'It was something between a sneeze and a cough,' she replied with reproachful dignity. "'And it got into my throat.' "'But,' she said afterward to Colin, "'I couldn't stop myself. "'It just burst out because all at once I couldn't help remembering "'that last big potato you ate, "'and the way your mouth stretched "'when you bit through that thick, lovely crust "'with jam and clotted cream on it. "'Is there any way in which those children can get food secretly?' "'Dr. Craven inquired of Mrs. Medlock.' "'There's no way unless they dig it out of the earth or pick it off the trees,' Mrs. Medlock answered. "'They stay out in the grounds all day and see no one but each other, and if they want anything different to eat from what's sent up to them, they need only ask for it.' "'Well,' said Dr. Craven, "'so long as going without food agrees with them, we need not disturb ourselves. The boy is a new creature.' "'So is the girl,' said Mrs. Medlock. She's begun to be downright pretty since she's filled out and lost her ugly little sour look. Her hair's grown thick and healthy-looking, and she's got a bright colour. The glummest, ill-natured little thing she used to be, and now her and Master Colin laugh together like a pair of crazy young ones. Perhaps they're growing fat on that. Perhaps they are, said Dr. Craven. Let them laugh. End of chapter 24 Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 18th, 2006, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. THE SECRET GARDEN by Francis Hodgson Burnett CHAPTER Twenty Five, THE CURTAIN And the secret garden bloomed and bloomed, and every morning revealed new miracles. In the robin's nest there were eggs, and the robin's mate sat upon them, keeping them warm with her feathery little breast and careful wings. At first she was very nervous, and the robin himself was indignantly watchful. Even Dickon did not go near the close-grown corner in those days, but waited until by the quiet working of some mysterious spell he seemed to have conveyed to the soul of the little pair that in the garden there was nothing which was not quite like themselves, nothing which did not understand the wonderfulness of what was happening to them, the immense, tender, terrible, heart-breaking beauty and solemnity of eggs. If there had been one person in that garden who had not known, through all his or her innermost being, that if an egg were taken away or hurt, the whole world would whirl round and crash through space and come to an end. If there had been even one who did not feel it, and act accordingly, there could have been no happiness, even in that golden springtime air." But they all knew it, and felt it, and the robin and his mate knew they knew it. At first the robin watched Mary and Colin with sharp anxiety. For some mysterious reason he knew he need not watch Dickon. The first moment he set his dew-bright black eye on Dickon, he knew he was not a stranger, but a sort of robin without beak or feathers. He could speak robin, 
which is a quite distinct language not to be mistaken for any other. To speak robin to a robin is like speaking French to a Frenchman. Dickon always spoke it to the robin himself, so the queer gibberish he used when he spoke to humans did not matter in the least. The robin thought he spoke this gibberish to them because they were not intelligent enough to understand feathered speech. His movements were also robin. They never startled one by being sudden enough to seem dangerous or threatening. Any robin could understand Dickon, so his presence was not even disturbing. But at the outset it seemed necessary to be on guard against the other two. In the first place, the boy creature did not come into the garden on his legs. He was pushed in on a thing with wheels, and the skins of wild animals were thrown over him. That in itself was doubtful. Then, when he began to stand up and move about, he did it in a queer, unaccustomed way, and the others seemed to have to help him. The robin used to secret himself in a bush and watch this anxiously, his head tilted first on one side and then on the other. He thought that the slow movements might mean that he was preparing to pounce, as cats do. When cats are preparing to pounce, they creep over the ground very slowly. The robin talked this over with his mate a great deal for a few days, but after that he decided not to speak of the subject, because her terror was so great that he was afraid it might be injurious to the eggs. When the boy began to walk by himself, and even to move more quickly, it was an immense relief. But for a long time, or it seemed a long time to the robin, he was a source of some anxiety. He did not act as the other humans did. He seemed very fond of walking, but he had a way of sitting or lying down for a while, and then getting up, in a disconcerting manner, to begin again. One day the robin remembered that when he himself had been made to learn to fly by his parents, he had done much the same sort of thing. He had taken short flights of a few yards, and then had been obliged to rest. So it occurred to him that this boy was learning to fly, or rather, to walk. He mentioned this to his mate, and when he told her that the eggs would probably conduct themselves in the same way after they were fledged, she was quite comforted and even became eagerly interested, and derived great pleasure from watching the boy over the edge of her nest, though she always thought that the eggs would be much cleverer and learn more quickly. But then she said indulgently that humans were always more clumsy and slow than eggs, and most of them never seemed really to learn to fly at all. You never met them in the air or on treetops. After a while the boy began to move about as the others did, but all three of the children at times did unusual things. They would stand under the trees, and move their arms and legs and heads about in a way which was neither walking, nor running, nor sitting down. They went through these movements at intervals every day, and the robin was never able to explain to his mate what they were doing or trying to do. He could only say that he was sure that the eggs would never flap about in such a manner, but, as the boy who could speak robin so fluently was doing the thing with them, birds could be quite sure that the actions were not of a dangerous nature. Of course, neither the robin nor his mate had ever heard of the champion wrestler Bob Hayworth and his exercises for making the muscles stand out like lumps. Robins are not like human beings. Their muscles are always exercised from the first, and so they develop themselves in a natural manner. If you have to fly about to find every meal you eat, your muscles do not become atrophied. Atrophied means wasted away through want of use. When the boy was walking and running about and digging and weeding like the others, the nest in the corner was brooded over by a great peace and content. Fears for the eggs became things of the past. Knowing that your eggs were as safe as if they were locked in a bank vault, and the fact that you could watch so many curious things going on, made setting a most entertaining occupation. On wet days the egg's mother sometimes felt even a little dull, because the children did not come into the garden. But even on wet days it could not be said that Mary and Colin were dull. 
one morning when the rain streamed down unceasingly, and Colin was beginning to feel a little restive, as he was obliged to remain on his sofa because it was not safe to get up and walk about, Mary had an inspiration. "'Now that I am a real boy,' Colin had said, "'my legs and arms and all my body are so full of magic that I can't keep them still. They want to be doing things all the time.' "'Do you know that when I waken in the morning, Mary, "'when it's quite early, and the birds are just shouting outside, "'and everything seems just shouting for joy, "'even the trees and things we can't really hear, "'I feel as if I must jump out of bed and shout myself. "'If I did it, just think what would happen.' "'Mary giggled inordinately. "'The nurse would come running, and Mrs. Medlock would come running, "'and they would be sure you had gone crazy,' "'and they'd send for the doctor,' she said. "'Colin giggled himself. "'He could see how they would all look, "'how horrified by his outbreak, "'and how amazed to see him standing upright. "'I wish my father would come home,' he said. "'I want to tell him myself. "'I'm always thinking about it. "'But we couldn't go on like this much longer. "'I can't stand lying still and pretending. "'And besides, I look too different.' I wish it wasn't raining today. It was then Mistress Mary had her inspiration. Colin, she began mysteriously, do you know how many rooms there are in this house? About a thousand, I suppose, he answered. There's about a hundred no one ever goes into, said Mary. And one rainy day I went and looked into ever so many of them. No one ever knew though Mrs. Medlock nearly found me out. I lost my way when I was coming back, and I stopped at the end of your corridor. That was the second time I heard you crying. Colin started up on his sofa. A hundred rooms no one goes into, he said. It sounds almost like a secret garden. Suppose we go and look at them. You could wheel me in my chair, and nobody would know where we went. That's what I was thinking said Mary. No one would dare to follow us. There are galleries where you could run. We could do our exercises. There is a little Indian room, where there is a cabinet full of ivory elephants. There are all sorts of rooms. Ring the bell, said Colin. When the nurse came in, he gave his orders. I want my chair, he said. Miss Mary and I are going to look at the part of the house which is not used. "'John can push me as far as the picture gallery, because there are some stairs. "'Then he must go away and leave us alone, until I send for him again.' "'Rainy days lost their terrors that morning. "'When the footman had wheeled the chair into the picture gallery, "'and left the two together in obedience to orders, "'Colin and Mary looked at each other, delighted. "'As soon as Mary had made sure that John was really on his way back to his own quarters below stairs, Colin got out of his chair. "'I am going to run from one end of the gallery to the other,' he said. "'And then I am going to jump, and then we will do Bob Hayworth's exercises.' And they did all these things and many others. They looked at the portraits, and found the plain little girl dressed in green brocade, and holding the parrot on her finger. "'All these,' said Colin, "'must be my relations.' They lived a long time ago. That parrot one, I believe, is one of my great, 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 great aunts. She looks rather like you, Mary, not as you look now, but as you looked when you came here. Now you are a great deal fatter and better looking. So are you, said Mary, and they both laughed. They went to the Indian room and amused themselves with the ivory elephants. They found the rose-coloured brocade boudoir, and the hole in the cushion the mouse had left, but the mice had grown up and run away, and the hole was empty. They saw more rooms, and made more discoveries than Mary had made on her first pilgrimage. They found new corridors and corners and flights of steps, and new old pictures they liked, and weird old things they did not know the use of. It was a curiously entertaining morning, and the feeling of wandering about in the same house with other people, 
but at the same time feeling as if one were miles away from them, was a fascinating thing. "'I'm glad we came,' Colin said. "'I never knew I lived in such a big, queer old place. I like it. We will ramble about every rainy day. We shall always be finding new queer corners and things.' That morning they had found, among other things, such good appetites that, when they returned to Colin's room, it was not possible to send the luncheon away untouched. When the nurse carried the tray downstairs, she slapped it down on the kitchen dresser so that Mrs. Loomis, the cook, could see the highly polished dishes and plates. "'Look at that,' she said. "'This is a house of mystery,' and those two children are the greatest mysteries in it. "'If they keep that up every day,' said the strong young footman John, "'there'd be small wonder that he weighs twice as much to-day as he did a month ago. I should have to give up my place in time for fear of doing my muscles an injury.' That afternoon Mary noticed that something new had happened in Colin's room. She had noticed it the day before, but had said nothing, because she thought the change— might have been made by chance. She said nothing to-day, but she sat, and looked fixedly at the picture over the mantel. She could look at it because the curtain had been drawn aside. That was the change she noticed. "'I know what you want me to tell you,' said Colin, after she had stared a few minutes. "'I always know when you want me to tell you something. You are wondering why the curtain is drawn back. I am going to keep it like that.' "'Why?' asked Mary. "'Because it doesn't make me angry any more to see her laughing. "'I wakened when it was bright moonlight two nights ago, "'and felt as if the magic was filling the room "'and making everything so splendid that I couldn't lie still. "'I got up and looked out of the window. "'The room was quite light, "'and there was a patch of moonlight on the curtain, "'and somehow that made me go and pull the cord.' She looked right down at me as if she were laughing because she was glad I was standing there. It made me like to look at her. I want to see her laughing like that all the time. I think she must have been a sort of magic person, perhaps. "'You are so like her now,' said Mary, "'that sometimes I think perhaps you are her ghost made into a boy.' That idea seemed to impress Colin. He thought it over, and then answered her slowly. "'If I were her ghost, my father would be fond of me.' "'Do you want him to be fond of you?' inquired Mary. "'I used to hate it because he was not fond of me. If he grew fond of me, I think I should tell him about the magic. It might make him more cheerful.' End of chapter 25 Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 18th, 2006, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. THE SECRET GARDEN CHAPTER Twenty Six. ITS MOTHER Their belief in the magic was an abiding thing. After the morning's incantations, Colin sometimes gave them magic lectures. "'I like to do it,' he explained, "'because when I grow up and make great scientific discoveries, I shall be obliged to lecture about them, and so this is practice.' I can only give short lectures now because I am very young, and besides, Ben Weatherstaff would feel as if he were in church, and he would go to sleep. "'The best thing about lecturin', said Ben, "'is that a chap can get up and say aught he pleases, and no other chap can answer him back. I wouldn't be again lecturin' a bit myself sometimes.' But when Colin held forth under his tree, old Ben fixed devouring eyes on him, and kept them there. He looked him over with critical affection. It was not so much the lecture which interested him, as the legs which looked straighter and stronger each day, the boyish head which held itself up so well, 
the once sharp chin and hollow cheeks, which had filled and rounded out, and the eyes which had begun to hold the light he remembered in another pair. Sometimes, when Colin felt Ben's earnest gaze meant that he was much impressed, he wondered what he was reflecting on, and once, when he had seemed quite entranced, he questioned him. "'What are you thinking about, Ben Weatherstaff?' he asked. "'I was thinking," answered Ben, "'as I'd warrant thus gone up three or four pound this week. I was looking at the calves and the shoulders. I'd like to get thee on a pair of scales.' "'It's the magic, and—and and Mrs. Sowerby's buns and milk and things,' said Colin. "'You see, the scientific experiment has succeeded.' That morning Dickon was too late to hear the lecture. When he came he was ruddy with running, and his funny face looked more twinkling than usual. As they had a good deal of weeding to do after the rains, they fell to work. They always had plenty to do after a warm, deep, sinking rain. The moisture which was good for the flowers was also good for the weeds which thrust up tiny blades of grass and points of leaves which must be pulled up before their roots took too firm hold. Colin was as good at weeding as any one in these days, and he could lecture while he was doing it. "'The magic works best when you work yourself,' he said this morning. You can feel it in your bones and muscles. I am going to read books about bones and muscles, but I am going to write a book about magic. I am making it up now. I keep finding out things. It was not very long after he had said this that he laid down his trowel and stood up on his feet. He had been silent for several minutes, and they had seen that he was thinking out lectures, as he often did. When he dropped his trowel and stood upright— it seemed to Mary and Dickon as if a sudden strong thought had made him do it. He stretched himself out to his tallest height, and he threw out his arms exultantly. Colour glowed in his face, and his strange eyes widened with joyfulness. All at once he had realised something to the full. "'Mary! Dickon!' he cried. "'Just look at me!' They stopped their weeding, and looked at him. "'Do you remember that first morning you brought me in here?' he demanded. Dickon was looking at him very hard. Being an animal charmer he could see more things than most people could, and many of them were things he never talked about. He saw some of them now in this boy. "'Ay, that we do,' he answered. Mary looked hard too, but she said nothing. "'Just this minute,' said Colin, "'all at once I remembered it myself, "'when I looked at my hand digging with the trowel, "'and I had to stand up on my feet to see if it was real. "'And it is real. I'm well. I'm well.' "'Aye, that the art,' said Dickon. "'I'm well. I'm well,' said Colin again, "'and his face went quite red all over.' He had known it before, in a way. He had hoped it, and felt it, and thought about it. But just at that minute something had rushed all through him. A sort of rapturous belief and realization, and it had been so strong that he could not help calling out. "'I shall live for ever and ever and ever,' he cried grandly. "'I shall find out thousands and thousands of things.' I shall find out about people and creatures and everything that grows, like Dickon, and I shall never stop making magic. I'm well. I'm well. I feel, I feel as if I want to shout out something, something thankful, joyful. Ben Weatherstaff, who had been working near a rose-bush, glanced round at him. "'The might sing the doxology,' he suggested in his driest grunt. He had no opinion of the doxology, and he did not make the suggestion with any particular reverence. But Colin was of an exploring mind, and he knew nothing about the doxology. "'What is that?' he inquired. "'Dickon can sing it for thee, I'll warrant,' replied Ben Weatherstaff. 
Dickon answered with his all-perceiving animal charmer's smile. "'They sing it at church,' he said. "'Mother says she believes the skylark sings it when they gets up in the morning.' "'If she says that, it must be a nice song,' Colin answered. "'I've never been in a church myself. I was always too ill. "'Sing it, Dickon. I want to hear it.' Dickon was quite simple and unaffected about it. He understood what Colin felt better than Colin did himself. He understood by a sort of instinct so natural that he did not know it was understanding. He pulled off his cap and looked round, still smiling. "'The must take off the cap,' he said to Colin. "'And so mun the, Ben, and the mun stand up, the nose.' Colin took off his cap and the sun shone on and warmed his thick hair as he watched Dickon intently. Ben Weatherstaff scrambled up from his knees and bared his head too, with a sort of puzzled, half-resentful look on his old face, as if he didn't know exactly why he was doing this remarkable thing. Dickon stood out among the trees and rose-bushes, and began to sing, in quite a simple, matter-of-fact way, and in a nice, strong, boy voice. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. When he had finished, Ben Weatherstaff was standing quite still, with his jaws set obstinately, but with a disturbed look in his eyes fixed on Colin. Colin's face was thoughtful and appreciative. "'It's a very nice song,' he said. "'I like it. Perhaps it means just what I mean when I want to shout out that I am thankful to the magic.' He stopped and thought in a puzzled way. "'Perhaps they are both the same thing. How can we know the exact names of everything?' "'Sing it again, Dickon. Let us try, Mary.' I want to sing it, too. It's my song. How does it begin? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And they sang it again, and Mary and Colin lifted their voices as musically as they could, and Dickens swelled quite loud and beautiful. And at the second line Ben Weatherstaff raspingly cleared his throat, and at the third line he joined in with such vigour that it seemed almost savage, and when the Amen, came to an end, Mary observed that the very same thing had happened to him, which had happened when he found out that Colin was not a cripple. His chin was twitching, and he was staring and winking, and his leathery old cheeks were wet. "'I never seed no sense in the doxology afore,' he said hoarsely. "'But I may change my mind in time.' "'I should say that gone up five pound this week, Mr. Colin. Five on em. "'Colin was looking across the garden at something attracting his attention, "'and his expression had become a startled one. "'Who is coming in here?' he said quickly. "'Who is it?' "'The door in the ivied wall had been pushed gently open, "'and a woman had entered. "'She had come in with the last line of their song, and she had stood still listening and looking at them. With the ivy behind her, the sunlight drifting through the trees and dappling her long blue cloak, and her nice fresh face smiling across the greenery, she was rather like a softly coloured illustration in one of Colin's books. She had wonderful affectionate eyes which seemed to take everything in, all of them, even Ben Weatherstaff and the creatures, and every flower that was in bloom. Unexpectedly as she had appeared, not one of them felt that she was an intruder at all. Dickens' eyes lighted like lamps. "'It's mother! That's who it is!' he cried, and went across the grass at a run. Colin began to move toward her too, and Mary went with him. They both felt their pulses beat faster. "'It's mother!' Dickon said again, when they met halfway. "'I know thou wanted to see her, and I told her where the door was hid.' Colin held out his hand with a sort of flushed royal shyness, 
but his eyes quite devoured her face. "'Even when I was ill I wanted to see you,' he said. "'You and Dickon and the secret garden. I'd never wanted to see anyone or anything before.' The sight of his uplifted face brought about a sudden change in her own. She flushed, and the corners of her mouth shook, and a mist seemed to sweep over her eyes. "'Eh, dear lad!' she broke out tremulously. "'Eh, dear lad!' As if she had not known she were going to say it. She did not say, "'Master Colin,' but just, "'Dear lad!' quite suddenly." She might have said it to Dickon in the same way, if she had seen something in his face which touched her. Colin liked it. "'Are you surprised because I am so well?' he asked. She put her hand on his shoulder, and smiled the mist out of her eyes. "'Ay, that I am,' she said. "'But thou art so like thy mother, thou made my heart jump.' "'Do you think,' said Colin, a little awkwardly, "'That will make my father like me?' "'Ay, for sure, dear lad,' she answered, and she gave his shoulder a soft, quick pat. "'He mun come home. He mun come home.' "'Susan Sowerby,' said Ben Weatherstaff, getting close to her, "'look at the lad's legs, wilt thou? They was like drumsticks is stockin' two month ago, and I heard folk tell as they was bandy and knock kneed both at the same time.' Look at em now. Susan Sowerby laughed a comfortable laugh. They're going to be fine, strong lads' legs in a bit, she said. Let him go on playin' and workin' in the garden, and eatin' hearty, and drinkin' plenty o' good sweet milk, and there'll not be a finer pair in Yorkshire, thank God for it. She put both hands on Mistress Mary's shoulders, and looked her little face over in a motherly fashion. "'And thee, too,' she said. "'Thou art grown near as hearty as our Elizabeth Ellen. "'I'll warrant thou art like thy mother, too. "'Our Martha told me, as Mrs. Medlock heard, she was a pretty woman. "'Thou'lt be like a blush rose when thou grows up, my little lass. "'Bless thee.' "'She did not mention that when Martha came home on her day out, "'and described the plain, sallow child, "'she had said that she had no confidence whatever in what Mrs. Medlock had heard.' "'It doesn't stand to reason that a pretty woman could be the mother of such a foul little lass,' she had added obstinately. Mary had not had time to pay much attention to her changing face. She had only known that she looked different, and seemed to have a great deal more hair, and that it was growing very fast. But, remembering her pleasure in looking at the Mem Sahib in the past, she was glad to hear that she might some day look like her. Susan Sowerby went round their garden with them, and was told the whole story of it, and shown every bush and tree which had come alive. Colin walked on one side of her, and Mary on the other. Each of them kept looking up at her comfortable rosy face, secretly curious about the delightful feeling she gave them, a sort of warm, supported feeling. It seemed as if she understood them, as Dickon understood his creatures— she stooped over the flowers, and talked about them as if they were children. Soot followed her, and once or twice cawed at her, and flew upon her shoulder as if it were Dickens. When they told her about the robin, and the first flight of the young ones, she laughed a motherly little mellow laugh in her throat. "'I suppose learnin' em to fly is like learnin' children to walk, but I'm feared I should be all in a warrant if mine had wings instead of legs,' she said." It was because she seemed such a wonderful woman in her nice moorland cottage way, that at last she was told about the magic. "'Do you believe in magic?' asked Colin, after he had explained about Indian fakirs. "'I hope you do.' "'That I do, lad,' she answered. "'I never knowed it by that name, but what does the name matter? I warrant they call it a different name in France, and a different one in Germany.' The same thing as set the seeds swellin', and the sun shinin', made thee a well lad, and it's the good thing. It isn't like us poor fools as think it matters if us is called out of our names. The big good thing doesn't stop to worry it, bless thee. It goes on makin' worlds by the million, worlds like us. 
Never thee stop believin' in the big good thing, and knowin' the world's full of it, and call it what the likes. Thou art singin' to it when I come into the garden. I felt so joyful, said Colin, opening his beautiful strange eyes at her. Suddenly I felt how different I was, how strong my arms and legs were, you know, and how I could dig and stand, and I jumped up and wanted to shout out something to anything that would listen. The magic listened when the sung the doxology. It would ha' listened to anything that sung. It was the joy that mattered. Eh, lad, lad, what's names to the joy-maker? And she gave his shoulders a quick soft pat again. She had packed a basket, which held a regular feast this morning, and when the hungry hour came, and Dickon brought it out from its hiding-place, she sat down with them under their tree, and watched them devour their food, laughing and quite gloating over their appetites. She was full of fun, and made them laugh at all sorts of odd things. She told them stories in broad Yorkshire, and taught them new words. She laughed as if she could not help it when they told her of the increasing difficulty there was in pretending that Colin was still a fretful invalid. "'You see, we can't help laughing nearly all the time when we are together,' explained Colin. "'And it doesn't sound ill at all. We try to choke it back, but it will burst out, and that sounds worse than ever. "'There's one thing that comes into my mind so often,' said Mary, and I can scarcely ever hold in when I think of it suddenly. I keep thinking, suppose Colin's face should get to look like a full moon. It isn't like one yet, but he gets a tiny bit fatter every day, and suppose some morning it should look like one. What should we do? Bless us all, I can see tha has a good bit of play actin' to do, said Susan Sowerby. But tha won't have to keep it up much longer. Mr. Craven'll come home. "'Do you think he will?' asked Colin. "'Why?' Susan Sowerby chuckled softly. "'I suppose it'd nigh break thy heart if he found out before tha told him in thy own way,' she said. "'Thaw's laid awake nights plannin' it.' "'I couldn't bear any one else to tell him,' said Colin. "'I think about different ways every day. I think now I just want to run into his room.' "'That'd be a fine start for him,' said Susan Sowerby. "'I'd like to see his face, lad. I would that. He mun come back. That he mun.' One of the things they talked of was the visit they were to make to her cottage. They planned it all. They were to drive over the moor and lunch out of doors among the heather. They would see all the twelve children and Dickens' garden, and would not come back until they were tired.' Susan Sowerby got up at last to return to the house and Mrs. Medlock. It was time for Colin to be wheeled back also, but before he got into his chair he stood quite close to Susan, and fixed his eyes on her with a kind of bewildered adoration, and he suddenly caught hold of the fold of her blue cloak and held it fast. "'You are just what I—what I wanted,' he said. "'I wish you were my mother, as well as Dickens.' All at once Susan Sowerby bent down, and drew him with her warm arms close against the bosom under the blue cloak, as if he had been Dickens' brother. The quick mist swept over her eyes. "'Eh, dear lad,' she said, "'thy own mother's in this ere very garden, I do believe. She couldna keep out of it. Thy father mun come back to thee. He mun.'" End of chapter 26 Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 18, 2006, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. THE SECRET GARDEN by Francis Hodgson Burnett CHAPTER Twenty Seven. IN THE GARDEN In each century since the beginning of the world wonderful things have been discovered. 
In the last century more amazing things were found out than in any century before. In this new century hundreds of things still more astounding will be brought to light. At first people refuse to believe that a strange new thing can be done. Then they begin to hope it can be done. Then they see it can be done. Then it is done, and all the world wonders why it was not done centuries ago. One of the new things people began to find out in the last century was that thoughts, just mere thoughts, are as powerful as electric batteries, as good for one as sunlight is, or as bad for one as poison. To let a sad thought or a bad one get into your mind is as dangerous as letting a scarlet fever germ get into your body. If you let it stay there after it has got in, you may never get over it as long as you live. So long as Mistress Mary's mind was full of disagreeable thoughts about her dislikes and sour opinions of people, and her determination not to be pleased by or interested in anything, she was a yellow-faced, sickly, bored, and wretched child. Circumstances, however, were very kind to her, though she was not at all aware of it. They began to push her about for her own good. When her mind gradually filled itself with robins, and moorland cottages crowded with children, with queer crabbed old gardeners and common little Yorkshire housemaids, with springtime and with secret gardens coming alive day by day, and also with a moor boy and his creatures, there was no room left for the disagreeable thoughts which affected her liver and her digestion, and made her yellow and tired. So long as Colin shut himself up in his room and thought only of his fears and weakness and his detestation of people who looked at him and reflected hourly on humps and early death, he was a hysterical, half-crazy little hypochondriac who knew nothing of the sunshine and the spring and also did not know that he could get well and could stand upon his feet if he tried to do it. When new beautiful thoughts began to push out the old hideous ones, Life began to come back to him, his blood ran healthily through his veins, and strength poured into him like a flood. His scientific experiment was quite practical and simple, and there was nothing weird about it at all. Much more surprising things can happen to anyone who, when a disagreeable or discouraged thought comes into his mind, just has the sense to remember in time and push it out by putting in an agreeable, determinedly courageous one. Two things cannot be in one place. Where you tend a rose, my lad, a thistle cannot grow. While the secret garden was coming alive, and two children were coming alive with it, there was a man wandering about certain far-away beautiful places in the Norwegian fjords, and the valleys and mountains of Switzerland, and he was a man who, for ten years had kept his mind filled with dark and heart-broken thinking. He had not been courageous. He had never tried to put any other thoughts in the place of the dark ones. He had wandered by blue lakes and thought them. He had lain on mountain sides with sheets of deep blue gentians blooming all about him, and flower-breaths filling all the air, and he had thought them. A terrible sorrow had fallen upon him when he had been happy, and he had let his soul fill itself with blackness, and had refused obstinately to allow any rift of light to pierce through. He had forgotten and deserted his home and his duties. When he travelled about, darkness so brooded over him that the sight of him was a wrong done to other people, because it was as if he poisoned the air about him with gloom. Most strangers thought he must be either half mad, or a man with some hidden crime on his soul. He was a tall man, with a drawn face and crooked shoulders, and the name he always entered on hotel registers was Archibald Craven, Misselthwaite Manor, Yorkshire, England. He had travelled far and wide since the day he saw Mistress Mary in his study, and told her she might have her bit of earth. He had been in the most beautiful places in Europe, though he had remained nowhere more than a few days. He had chosen the quietest and remotest spots. He had been on the tops of mountains whose heads were in the clouds, 
and had looked down on other mountains when the sun rose, and touched them with such light as made it seem as if the world were just being born. But the light had never seemed to touch himself until one day when he realized that, for the first time in ten years, a strange thing had happened. He was in a wonderful valley in the Austrian Tyrol, and he had been walking alone through such beauty as might have lifted any man's soul out of shadow. He had walked a long way, and it had not lifted his. But at last he had felt tired, and had thrown himself down to rest on a carpet of moss by a stream. It was a clear little stream which ran quite merrily along on its narrow way through the luscious damp greenness. Sometimes it made a sound rather like very low laughter as it bubbled over and round stones. He saw birds come and dip their heads to drink in it, and then flick their wings and fly away. It seemed like a thing alive, and yet its tiny voice made the stillness seem deeper. The valley was very, very still. As he sat gazing into the clear running of the water, Archibald Craven gradually felt his mind and body both grow quiet, as quiet as the valley itself. He wondered if he were going to sleep, but he was not. He sat and gazed at the sunlit water, and his eyes began to see things growing at its edge. There was one lovely mass of blue forget-me-nots growing so close to the stream that its leaves were wet, and at these he found himself looking as he remembered he had looked at such things years ago. He was actually thinking tenderly how lovely it was, and what wonders of blue its hundreds of little blossoms were. He did not know that just that simple thought was slowly filling his mind, filling and filling it, until other things were softly pushed aside. It was as if a sweet clear spring had begun to rise in a stagnant pool, and had risen and risen until at last it swept the dark water away. But of course he did not think of this himself. He only knew that the valley seemed to grow quieter and quieter as he sat and stared at the bright, delicate blueness. He did not know how long he sat there, or what was happening to him, but at last he moved as if he were awakening, and he got up slowly and stood on the moss carpet, drawing a long, deep, soft breath and wondering at himself. Something seemed to have been unbound and released in him, very quietly. "'What is it?' he said, almost in a whisper, and he passed his hand over his forehead. "'I almost feel as if I were alive. I do not know enough about the wonderfulness of undiscovered things to be able to explain how this had happened to him. Neither does anyone else yet. He did not understand at all himself, but he remembered this strange hour months afterward when he was at Misselthwaite again, and he found out quite by accident that on this very day Colin had cried out as he went into the secret garden, I am going to live for ever and ever and ever. The singular calmness remained with him the rest of the evening, and he slept a new, reposeful sleep but it was not with him very long. He did not know that it could be kept. By the next night he had opened the doors wide to his dark thoughts, and they had come trooping and rushing back. He left the valley, and went on his wandering way again. But, strange as it seemed to him, there were minutes, sometimes half-hours, when, without his knowing why, the black burden seemed to lift itself again, and he knew he was a living man, and not a dead one. Slowly, slowly, for no reason that he knew of, he was coming alive with the garden. As the golden summer changed into the deep golden autumn, he went to the lake of Como. There he found the loveliness of a dream. He spent his days upon the crystal blueness of the lake, or he walked back into the soft, thick verdure of the hills, and tramped until he was tired so that he might sleep. 
but by this time he had begun to sleep better, he knew, and his dreams had ceased to be a terror to him. Perhaps, he thought, my body is growing stronger. It was growing stronger, but because of the rare peaceful hours when his thoughts were changed, his soul was slowly growing stronger too. He began to think of Misselthwaite, and wonder if he should not go home. Now and then he wondered vaguely about his boy, and asked himself what he should feel when he went and stood by the carved four-posted bed again, and looked down at the sharply chiselled ivory-white face while it slept, and the black lashes rimmed so startlingly the close-shut eyes. He shrank from it. One marvel of a day he had walked so far that when he returned the moon was high and full, and all the world was purple shadow and silver. The stillness of lake and shore and wood was so wonderful that he did not go into the villa he lived in. He walked down to a little bowered terrace at the water's edge, and sat upon a seat, and breathed in all the heavenly scents of the night. He felt the strange calmness stealing over him, and it grew deeper and deeper until he fell asleep. He did not know when he fell asleep, and when he began to dream. His dream was so real that he did not feel as if he were dreaming. He remembered afterward how intensely wide awake and alert he had thought he was. He thought that as he sat and breathed in the scent of the late roses, and listened to the lapping of the water at his feet, he heard a voice calling. It was sweet and clear and happy and far away. It seemed very far, but he heard it as distinctly as if it had been at his very side. Archie, 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 it said, and then again sweeter and clearer than before. Archie, Archie. He thought he sprang to his feet, not even startled. It was such a real voice, and it seemed so natural that he should hear it. "'Lilius! Lilius!' he answered. "'Lilius, where are you?' "'In the garden!' it came back like a sound from a golden flute. "'In the garden!' And then the dream ended, but he did not awaken. He slept soundly and sweetly all through the lovely night. When he did awake at last it was brilliant morning, and a servant was standing staring at him. He was an Italian servant, and was accustomed, as all the servants of the villa were, to accepting without question any strange thing his foreign master might do. No one ever knew when he would go out or come in, or where he would choose to sleep, or if he would roam about the garden, or lie in the boat on the lake all night. The man held a salver with some letters on it, and he waited quietly until Mr. Craven took them. When he had gone away, Mr. Craven sat a few moments holding them in his hand and looking at the lake. His strange calm was still upon him, and something more, a lightness, as if the cruel thing which had been done had not happened as he thought, as if something had changed. He was remembering the dream, the real, real dream. "'In the garden,' he said, wondering at himself, "'in the garden, but the door is locked, and the key is buried deep.' When he glanced at the letters a few minutes later, he saw that the one lying at the top of the rest was an English letter, and came from Yorkshire. It was directed in a plain woman's hand, but it was not a hand he knew. He opened it, scarcely thinking of the writer, but the first words attracted his attention at once. "'Dear Sir, I am Susan Sowerby that made bold to speak to you once on the moor. It was about Miss Mary I spoke. I will make bold to speak again. Please, sir, I would come home, if I was you.' I think you would be glad to come, and, if you will excuse me, sir, I think your lady would ask you to come, if she was here. Your obedient servant. 
Susan Sowerby. Mr. Craven read the letter twice before he put it back in its envelope. He kept thinking about the dream. "'I will go back to Misselthwaite,' he said. "'Yes, I'll go at once.' And he went through the garden to the villa, and ordered Pitcher to prepare for his return to England. In a few days he was in Yorkshire again, and on his long railroad journey he found himself thinking of his boy, as he had never thought in all the ten years past. During those years he had only wished to forget him. Now, though he did not intend to think about him, memories of him constantly drifted into his mind. He remembered the black days when he had raved like a madman because the child was alive and the mother was dead. He had refused to see it, and when he had gone to look at it at last it had been such a weak, wretched thing that every one had been sure it would die in a few days. But, to the surprise of those who took care of it, the days passed, and it lived, and then every one believed it would be a deformed and crippled creature. He had not meant to be a bad father, but he had not felt like a father at all. He had supplied doctors and nurses and luxuries, but he had shrunk from the mere thought of the boy, and had buried himself in his own misery. The first time after a year's absence he returned to Misselthwaite, and the small, miserable-looking thing languidly and indifferently lifted to his face the great grey eyes with black lashes round them, so like, and yet so horribly unlike the happy eyes he had adored, he could not bear the sight of them, and turned away pale as death. After that he scarcely ever saw him except when he was asleep, and all he knew of him was that he was a confirmed invalid, with a vicious, hysterical, half-insane temper. He could only be kept from furies dangerous to himself by being given his own way in every detail. All this was not an uplifting thing to recall, but as the train whirled him through mountain passes and golden plains, the man who was coming alive began to think in a new way, and he thought long, and steadily, and deeply. "'Perhaps I have been all wrong for ten years,' he said to himself. Ten years is a long time. It may be too late to do anything, quite too late. What have I been thinking of?' Of course, this was the wrong magic, to begin by saying too late. Even Colin could have told him that. But he knew nothing of magic, either black or white. This he had yet to learn. He wondered if Susan Sowerby had taken courage and written to him only because the motherly creature had realized that the boy was much worse, was fatally ill. If he had not been under the spell of the curious calmness which had taken possession of him, he would have been more wretched than ever. But the calm had brought a sort of courage and hope with it. Instead of giving way to thoughts of the worst, he actually found he was trying to believe in better things. "'Could it be possible that she sees that I may be able to do him good, and control him?' he thought. "'I will go and see her on my way to Misselthwaite.' But when on his way across the moor he stopped the carriage at the cottage, seven or eight children who were playing about gathered in a group, and bobbing seven or eight friendly and polite curtsies, told him that their mother had gone to the other side of the moor early in the morning, to help a woman who had a new baby. "'Our Dickon,' they volunteered, "'was over at the manor, working in one of the gardens, where he went several days each week.' Mr. Craven looked over the collection of sturdy little bodies and round red-cheeked faces, each one grinning in its own particular way, and he awoke to the fact that they were a healthy, likeable lot. He smiled at their friendly grins, and took a golden sovereign from his pocket, and gave it to our Elizabeth Ellen, who was the oldest. "'If you divide that into eight parts, there will be half a crown for each of you,' he said. Then, amid grins and chuckles and bobbing of curtsies, he drove away, leaving ecstasy and nudging elbows and little jumps of joy behind. The drive across the wonderfulness of the moor was a soothing thing. 
why did it seem to give him a sense of homecoming, which he had been sure he could never feel again, that sense of the beauty of land and sky and purple bloom of distance, and a warming of the heart at drawing nearer to the great old house, which had held those of his blood for six hundred years. How he had driven away from it the last time, shuddering to think of its closed rooms, and the boy lying in the four-posted bed with the brocaded hangings. Was it possible that perhaps he might find him changed a little for the better, and that he might overcome his shrinking from him? How real that dream had been! How wonderful and clear the voice which called back to him, "'In the garden! In the garden!' "'I will try to find the key,' he said. "'I will try to open the door. "'I must, though I don't know why.' "'When he arrived at the manor, "'the servants who received him with the usual ceremony "'noticed that he looked better, "'and that he did not go to the remote rooms "'where he usually lived, attended by Pitcher. "'He went into the library and sent for Mrs. Medlock. "'She came to him somewhat excited and curious and flustered.' "'How is Master Colin, Medlock?' he inquired. "'Well, sir,' Mrs. Medlock answered. "'He's—he's he's different, in a manner of speaking.' "'Worse?' he suggested. Mrs. Medlock really was flushed. "'Well, you see, sir,' she tried to explain, "'neither Dr. Craven, nor the nurse, nor me can exactly make him out.' "'Why is that?' "'To tell the truth, sir, Master Colin might be better, and he might be changing for the worse. His appetite, sir, is past understanding, and his ways—' "'Has he become more—more more peculiar?' her master asked, knitting his brows anxiously. "'That's it, sir. He's growing very peculiar, when you compare him with what he used to be. He used to eat nothing.' and then suddenly he began to eat something enormous, and then he stopped again all at once, and the meals were sent back just as they used to be. You never knew, sir, perhaps, that out of doors he would never let himself be taken. The things we've gone through to get him to go out in his chair would leave a body trembling like a leaf. He'd throw himself into such a state that Dr. Craven said he couldn't be responsible for forcing him. Well, sir, just without warning— not long after one of his worst tantrums, he suddenly insisted on being taken out every day by Miss Mary and Susan Sowerby's boy Dickon that could push his chair. He took a fancy to both Miss Mary and Dickon, and Dickon brought his tame animals, and, if you'll credit it, sir, out of doors he will stay from morning until night. "'How does he look?' was the next question. "'If he took his food natural, sir, you'd think he was putting on flesh, "'but we're afraid it may be a sort of bloat. "'He laughs sometimes in a queer way when he's alone with Miss Mary. "'He never used to laugh at all. "'Dr. Craven is coming to see you at once, if you'll allow him. "'He never was as puzzled in his life.' "'Where is Master Colin now?' Mr. Craven asked. "'In the garden, sir. He's always in the garden.' "'though not a human creature is allowed to go near, for fear they'll look at him.' "'Mr. Craven scarcely heard her last words. "'In the garden,' he said. "'And after he had sent Mrs. Medlock away, he stood and repeated it again and again. "'In the garden.' "'He had to make an effort to bring himself back to the place he was standing in, and when he felt he was on earth again, he turned and went out of the room. He took his way, as Mary had done, through the door in the shrubbery, and among the laurels and the fountain beds. The fountain was playing now, and was encircled by beds of brilliant autumn flowers. He crossed the lawn, and turned into the long walk by the ivied walls. He did not walk quickly, but slowly, and his eyes were on the path. He felt as if he were being drawn back to the place he had so long forsaken, and he did not know why. As he drew near to it his step became still more slow. 
He knew where the door was, even though the ivy hung thick over it, but he did not know exactly where it lay, that buried key. So he stopped, and stood still, looking about him, and almost the moment after he had paused, he started and listened, asking himself if he were walking in a dream. The ivy hung thick over the door, the key was buried under the shrubs, no human being had passed that portal for ten lonely years. And yet, inside the garden there were sounds. There were the sounds of running, scuffling feet seeming to chase round and round under the trees. There were strange sounds of lowered, suppressed voices, exclamations, and smothered joyous cries. It seemed actually like the laughter of young things, the uncontrollable laughter of children who were trying not to be heard, but who, in a moment or so, as their excitement mounted, would burst forth. What in heaven's name was he dreaming of? What in heaven's name did he hear? Was he losing his reason, and thinking he heard things which were not for human ears? Was it that the far clear voice had meant? And then the moment came, the uncontrollable moment, when the sounds forgot to hush themselves. The feet ran faster and faster. They were nearing the garden door. There was quick, strong, young breathing, and a wild outbreak of laughing which could not be contained. And the door in the wall was flung wide open, the sheet of ivy swinging back, and a boy burst through it at full speed, and, without seeing the outsider, dashed almost into his arms. Mr. Craven had extended them just in time to save him from falling as a result of his unseeing dash against him, and when he held him away to look at him in amazement at his being there, he truly gasped for breath. He was a tall boy, and a handsome one. He was glowing with life, and his running had sent splendid color leaping to his face. He threw the thick hair back from his forehead, and lifted a pair of strange grey eyes, eyes full of boyish laughter, and rimmed with black lashes like a fringe. It was the eyes which made Mr. Craven gasp for breath. "'Who? What? Who?' he stammered. This was not what Colin had expected. This was not what he had planned. He had never thought of such a meeting, and yet to come dashing out— Winning a race, perhaps it was even better. He drew himself up to his very tallest. Mary, who had been running with him, and had dashed through the door too, believed that he managed to make himself look taller than he had ever looked before, inches taller. Father, he said, I'm Colin. You can't believe it. I scarcely can myself. I'm Colin. Like Mrs. Medlock, he did not understand what his father meant when he said hurriedly, "'In the garden! In the garden!' "'Yes,' hurried on Colin. "'It was the garden that did it, and Mary, and Dickon, and the creatures, and the magic. No one knows. We kept it to tell you when you came. I'm well. I can beat Mary in a race. I'm going to be an athlete.' He said it all so like a healthy boy." his face flushed, his words tumbling over each other in his eagerness, that Mr. Craven's soul shook with unbelieving joy. Colin put out his hand and laid it on his father's arm. "'Aren't you glad, father?' he ended. "'Aren't you glad? I'm going to live for ever and ever and ever.' Mr. Craven put his hands on both the boy's shoulders and held him still. He knew he dared not even try to speak for a moment." "'Take me into the garden, my boy,' he said at last, "'and tell me all about it.' And so they led him in. The place was a wilderness of autumn gold and purple and violet blue and flaming scarlet, and on every side were sheaves of late lilies standing together, lilies which were white or white and ruby, he remembered well when the first of them had been planted that just at this season of the year their late glories should reveal themselves. 
Late roses climbed and hung and clustered, and the sunshine deepening the hue of the yellowing trees made one feel that one stood in an embowered temple of gold. The newcomer stood silent just as the children had done when they came into its greyness. He looked round and round. I thought it would be dead, he said. Mary thought so at first, said Colin. "'but it came alive. "'Then they sat down under their tree, "'all but Colin, who wanted to stand "'while he told the story. "'It was the strangest thing he had ever heard, "'Archibald Craven thought, "'as it was poured forth in headlong boy fashion. "'Mystery and magic and wild creatures, "'the weird midnight meeting, "'the coming of the spring,' the passion of insulted pride which had dragged the young Rajah to his feet to defy old Ben Weatherstaff to his face. The odd companionship, the play-acting, the great secret so carefully kept. The listener laughed until tears came into his eyes, and sometimes tears came into his eyes when he was not laughing. The athlete, the lecturer, the scientific discoverer was a laughable, lovable, "'healthy young human thing. "'Now,' he said at the end of the story, "'it need not be a secret any more. "'I dare say it will frighten them nearly into fits when they see me. "'But I am never going to get into the chair again. "'I shall walk back with you, father, to the house.' "'Ben Weatherstaff's duties rarely took him away from the gardens, "'but on this occasion he made an excuse to carry some vegetables to the kitchen.' and being invited into the servants' hall by Mrs. Medlock to drink a glass of beer, he was on the spot, as he had hoped to be, when the most dramatic event Misselthwaite Manor had seen during the present generation actually took place. One of the windows looking upon the courtyard gave also a glimpse of the lawn. Mrs. Medlock, knowing Ben had come from the gardens, hoped that he might have caught sight of his master, and even by chance of his meeting with Master Colin. "'Did you see either of them, Weatherstaff?' she asked. Ben took his beer-mug from his mouth, and wiped his lips with the back of his hand. "'Aye, that I did,' he answered, with a shrewdly significant air. "'Both of them?' suggested Mrs. Medlock. "'Both of them returned Ben Weatherstaff. "'Thank you kindly, ma'am. I could sup up another mug of it.' "'Together?' said Mrs. Medlock, hastily overfilling his beer-mug in her excitement. "'Together, ma'am.' And Ben gulped down half of his new mug at one gulp. "'Where was Master Colin? How did he look? What did they say to each other?' "'I did not hear that,' said Ben. "'along o' only being on the step-ladder looking over the wall. "'But I'll tell thee this. "'There's been things going on outside as you house-people knows nowt about. "'And what thou'll find out, thou'll find out soon.' "'And it was not two minutes before he swallowed the last of his beer "'and waved his mug solemnly toward the window, "'which took in through the shrubbery a piece of the lawn. "'Look there,' he said, "'if thus curious.' "'Look what's coming across the grass.' "'When Mrs. Medlock looked, she threw up her hands and gave a little shriek, "'and every man and woman servant within hearing bolted across the servants' hall, "'and stood looking through the window with their eyes almost starting out of their heads. "'Across the lawn came the master of Misselthwaite, "'and he looked as many of them had never seen him, "'and by his side, with his head up in the air, and his eyes full of laughter, walked as strongly and steadily as any boy in Yorkshire, Master Colin. End of chapter 27 and the end of The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 20th, 2006 in Oceanside, California.